Thursday, February 8th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Um, and I was going to ask the clerk to call the roll, but. Um, uh, <laughs> the clerk has left the room. It's true. So I will, um, I'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Present. 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 Yes. <laughs> Here. Present. Present. Okay. Um, Mr. Zahowski will be joining us shortly. He's at an open house uh, this evening, so he'll be here shortly. Um, uh, we'll begin tonight's uh, meeting with the public comment period. Um, I would ask folks, I know some folks have signed up, um, and I don't know if I have the sign up. Okay. We can leave it up there. Um, I know a couple of people signed up. Um, uh, so, uh, I, well, I can't see that far. Um, so I guess what I would ask people to do is if you could come up to the podium uh, and just please state your name um, and address for the record. Um, I'll be keeping a three minute timer. I'd ask you to please keep your remarks to three minutes or less. And um, I know some of you have signed up. So if you can remember who signed up, uh, just come up. Uh. Hi, everybody. Um, Ellen Brown, and I'm from Waitley, Massachusetts. I consider myself a seasoned teacher. I've worked in early childhood for my entire career. I've worked as a therapeutic teacher, a teacher trainer, a special education preschool teacher, a kindergarten teacher, and now as a first grade teacher at the Jackson Street Elementary School. Inclusion and differentiation have been important parts of my practice for years, and everyone is welcome in my classroom. My current year of teaching has been the most challenging since my early years as a new teacher. 62% of my students receive intervention services, including Title I math and or reading, social skills services, ELL services, counseling, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, and special education support in writing, reading, and or math. All of my students are considered fully included but over 60% of the special education services are delivered outside the classroom. Behavior management is also a consideration in this high needs classroom. I support students who exhibit a range of emotional needs including anxiety, low frustration, impulsiveness, immaturity, trauma related behaviors, inflexibility, obstinance, and occasional physical aggression. This is not my idea of, in of inclusion and this is not my idea of co-teaching. Heard, I've heard this model is to continue next year without changes, despite the serious concerns of teachers and parents. Here are my ideas for your consideration. No more imbalanced classrooms. Student needs should go beyond a checkoff box of having an IEP or not. IEPs need to be studied and student needs must be carefully identified. Just as well, students who are not receiving specialized education need their unique needs to be identified. Academic, emotional, and social needs of all students need to be carefully considered when placing children in classrooms. Uh, number two, no more imbalanced caseloads. Currently, one special education teacher is assigned per grade level, no matter how many children require specialized education. Special, ed special education <coughs> teachers should be assigned by caseload or classroom, not by grade level. We cannot assume that students needing specialized education will be evenly dispersed among grade levels through any given school. No more warehousing of students. Students exist in our district who are performing well below grade level, despite the best efforts from classroom teachers and specialists. Without former programs like the Alternative Learning Program or the Goals Program, we can expect these students to languish year in and year out without, with their very specific, specific needs unmet. And lastly, more inclusion services. Despite the, dist the district's decision to abolish special programs and to provide an inclusion co-teaching model, most IEPs are written as they always have been, with most specialized services 
being provided outside the classroom. IEPs need to be carefully crafted based on student need to deliver services in the classroom wherever possible. This would fac facilitate co-teaching and a truer representation of the practice of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, the next speaker. Good evening. My name is Andrea Egito, and I teach kindergarten in Northampton. I'm also the teacher chapter coordinator for the Northampton Association of School Employees. Um, I'm here to share with you tonight a petition that is currently being signed by all of the Northampton employees in support of our colleagues, in solidarity, and in a request for additional and adequate funding for the inclusion program that the district has put into place. We, the undersigned members of the Northampton Association of School Employees, support our colleagues at Bridge Street School and their concerns with unsafe conditions for students and educators in the building. The lack of adequate staffing has made it impossible to properly implement a new inclusion model for special education. Misguided budget decisions have resulted in dangerous working conditions and poor morale in our schools. The pursuit of a grievance against the school committee which was denied, which has denied our claims of unsafe working conditions. Dismay among students, parents and educators across the district caused by lack of support shown thus far by the superintendent, school committee and Mayor Narkowitz. While the inadequate staffing may save money, it is not the best interest, it is not in the best interest of Northampton students, educators and their success. Funding Bridge Street School at the expense of other schools is not an acceptable solution. We request that Superintendent Provost and Mayor Narkowitz provide the resources necessary for every Northampton student and educator to succeed. Our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. This is not to say that there aren't positive and wonderful things happening in the Northampton Public Schools every single day and that every single Northampton employee works their hardest and gives their all to their students. But we need your help. We need additional resources to help us with the crisis that has developed based on this inclusion program. No one is saying that there aren't wonderful things happening. There are every day. Please come see them. Come to any one of the classrooms of these educators. See our students learning and thriving. However, there are many students that need more. And what we are trying to do as a staff of the Northampton Public Schools, and we're only a union because we stand together. It's not a separate entity. Our union is our employees. And we are standing before you begging for your assistance and for your acknowledgement of the need Please just acknowledge that there is a need that is not currently being met under the model that has been funded. Thank you. Hello. My name is Lee Graham. I live at 89 Marion Street. I have a son at uh, Bridge Street School. Um, I have prepared remarks. I also want to thank the teachers for being here tonight and for, for speaking. I really appreciate hearing from them and from the union. They are one and the same. So I also want to say thank you to the school committee um, and to the school and district leadership for working with parents this year to improve Bridge Street School and inclusive education in the Northampton Public Schools. Regarding the issues at Bridge Street, um, one thing that Dr. Provo said at the January 25th school council meeting was that the district is all in this together, that all the schools and stakeholders are invested in the success of Bridge Street. And I can see that through the input and support that we've gotten from teachers and staff at other schools, and I really appreciate that, so thank you. 
I also want to thank the City Council for listening and engaging with parents about our concerns for Bridge Street and for the broader municipal issue of funding for Northampton Public Schools. So I've spent a lot of time this year thinking about Bridge Street and its challenges and its possibilities. Uh, instead of doing my actual job, I've been <laughs> spending a lot of time on this. So I see a lot of potential for the school. Um, I love its diversity. I love the feeling of acceptance and intolerance that I, I, I think is, is present there. I love that it's the downtown school as a ur trained urban planner. Um, but I also think that parents' advocacy has uncovered a, a whole range of, of deeper challenges beyond just the rollout of, of wins. And I really want to encourage the school committee and, and administration and the city government <coughs> to use this opportunity to really equitably and effectively uh, staff Bridge Street and design a truly inclusive school district going forward. I have some recommendations that I want to share. I've, I've sent them via email and in conversation to school committee and city council members uh, before and now, but I'd like to read them into the record. These are based on things I've learned from the activism of parents over the year, from talking with Principal Choquette, Dr. Provost, Student Services, from doing research on my own, and from asking academic colleagues who work in K-12 policy. So first, Bridge Street needs additional professional, non-instructional staff, full-time, not contracted, behavioral and therapeutic staff to work with the level of need um, that our students exhibit there. And uh, I would look to the teachers and Principal Choquette, student services, and Dr. Provost to uh, specify sort of what that might look like, but we need it. Secondly, I'd like to see more administrative leadership at the school level or at the district level really thinking about WINS reform and other inclusion uh, efforts going forward. So again, at that January 25th meeting, Principal Choquette talked about um, Ms. Nora, the tiered support specialist, as a de facto vice principal. And uh, Ms. Nora and Ms. Sperry are so stretched that maybe there's something there. Maybe we need um, some type of leadership at the school to think about this. And then the last thing, I know I'm at my limit, but I'd really like to know or encourage training for the administration and the school committee around inclusive, inclusion best practices. And I really think that for budgeting and overseeing the schools and the district, we all need to have a common framework for understanding the changing needs of our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ala Katznelson. I live at 28 Woodbine Avenue. Um, my child is a first grader at Bridge Street as well. Um, my family moved to Northampton about four years ago and we were really excited to find a home about half a mile from our local school. Um, and we fully intended to keep our son at Bridge Street Elementary School for, the entire, for, his, for his elementary education. Um, and this year, our excitement turned to deep dismay and I feel we, we feel betrayed by the school district. Um, I actually find it hard to believe that the issues that have plagued the school this year, not just in the first, first grade, are happening in an affluent college town. The WINS model rolled out this year, that was rolled out this year was presented as a matter of social justice, as a way that children with different needs and abilities can learn, side, uh, can learn alongside each other and can learn from each other. But as a parent, it really seems very clear that this was a massive budget cut dressed up in social justice garb. Um, social inclusion programs with the, with the intense level of need that we, that we see in our classrooms can't possibly look like this. Um, so it just seems fundamentally a fact that the school district is trying to do something that is fundamentally more expensive with less money. Um, so it seems that w to me that what has happened this year is, is sort of the opposite of inclusion. Not only have the ideals of inclusion not been met, but I would wager that those ideals and how our children might see them have actually been damaged. Rather than seeing their peers learning at different paces and in different ways, both general ed and special ed kids have seen their peers and probably their teachers too at their worst. I find this deeply, deeply sad. My child is a general ed student. He doesn't have any specific special needs, but he does have needs in an educational setting, as all kids do. Um, his classroom teachers, though, have had much bigger problems to solve than attending to them. Um, then there's the academics. Of course, the investment and the intense uh, focus in solving the issues that came up this year was warranted. <coughs> but did our kids learn as much as they should and could have? My educated guess, listening to him and having observed the classroom, is no. 
Um, I am not an educator. I do not know what Bridge Street needs to return to its path as a school with perhaps some longstanding troubles, but a bright and rising future. I believe we can be that school, and I beg the school committee to, say, to think seriously about how that can happen and to listen to all of the advice and all of the thoughts and all of the needs that the teachers might express um, and to provide the funding to get the school back on track. Not doing so would, quite frankly, be a stain on our town. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment period? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Liz Bowen. I live at 95 Straw Avenue in Florence. Um, I think I'm probably an anomaly here tonight in that I am not a Northampton Public Schools employee and I do not currently have a child in the schools. My kids are not school age yet. Um, I am a teacher and I've worked in a variety of public districts in the area and a charter school. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of things about data, data says, and I, I've seen that in a lot of educational settings before. And I think that when the teachers are telling you that what the data says doesn't match what they're living, it's important to look at how you're choosing the data that you're looking at and what's being missed in that data. Because while data is very important and can tell us a lot, kids are all different. And that's a cliche we talk about how important differentiated instruction is and all of that. But as, as somebody earlier alluded to, every kid with an IEP isn't the same and every general ed kid isn't the same. And if your teachers are telling you something, this isn't working, the data says it should be working, they're telling us that it's not working. And to me, that means there's something wrong with our data because the teachers didn't just suddenly decide that there was a problem. And we don't have many parents here tonight, but I did just want to point out that we're here having this conversation because we have public school committee meetings. We have democratically elected school committees that are answerable to the voters. And our teachers have a union that give them the opportunity to have a voice and to say things that might be unpopular. And to anybody who feels hesitant about public education right now, I would just like to point out that we are here having this conversation because of the very unique qualities of public education, because our teachers have a union and because we have a publicly elected, publicly accountable school committee. And I think that's really important and I don't think that we could be having this conversation without it. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment? Okay, um, hearing none, we'll uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Okay, hearing none, um, we'll move on to recommended actions. Um, we have several items on our consent agenda this evening. We have the approval of minutes of the negotiating subcommittee of August 10th and August 16th and October 23rd, 2017. We have minutes of the school committee on November 9th, 2017 and January 11th, 2018. We have minutes of rules and policy subcommittee January 18th, 2018. And we have the minutes of the school committee retreat January 31st, 2018. 
We also have budget transfer approvals, uh, transfers to fund out-of-district tuition for JFK student, transfers to fund long-term substitute for leave of absence, transfer to reduce ESP position to increase teacher hours at NHS, transfer to fund long-term substitute teacher position at Bridge Street, transfers to fund out-of-district tuition for Bridge Street student, and transfers to cover deficit in non-public tuitions with excess in collaborative tuition. Third, we have field trip requests. We have the NHS robotics team going to the U.S. robotics competition in Waterbury, Connecticut, March 9th through the 11th, 2018. We also have the robotics team traveling to the U.S. first robotics con competition in Smithfield, Rhode Island on March 23rd through the 25th of 2018. We have the NHS senior class uh, going to the Red Sox at Fenway Park, Boston, Massachusetts, April 27th. Go Sox. NHS uh, senior class going to High Meadow in Granby, Connecticut, May 30th, 2018. And I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Um, next, we'll move on. <coughs> Reports and recommendations, and we begin with a report from our student representative, Elena Fragamini. Hi, good evening. Um, so recently the Student Union has created the Student Union Fund, um, which are reserved funds to support and sustain projects that will ultimately benefit Northampton High School student and school community. Uh, these funds are open to any individuals or clubs or groups that are interested in applying for financial support for projects that will benefit our school long term. Uh, the Student Union was really inspired by the great work the Northampton Education Foundation has done in creating an organized grant application process to benefit our schools. Um, applications can be found in the Northampton High office or on Northampton High's Student Union Facebook page. Last Friday, the Young Democrats Club, Feminist Collective, Gender Sexuality Alliance, and Environmental Club co-sponsored a town hall with U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern. Around 600 to 700 students attended the hour and a half long assembly. Students were invited to submit uh, questions in advance and then were invited to ask Congressman McGovern their questions, which ranged from questions about immigration reform to the opioid epidemic to climate change and college affordability. The assembly was filmed by Northampton High Technology students and is currently up on the NHS Tech YouTube channel if any of you would like to check it out. Um, I also want to extend some congratulations to Northampton High's winners of this year's Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, first, Adrian Albro Fisher and Lucia Khan Sperling for photography, Naomi Brennick and Brina Brown, Tashi Salcedo and Indy Francis for painting and art portfolios, and myself for work on Northampton High's student news broadcast. Um, this is a testament both to all of these students' individual talent, but I think notably also the incredible commitment of Northampton High Arts teachers in developing our students' talents, but also in helping them access the awards opportunities. I also want to extend a congratulations to Emma Tanner and Hazel Ethier for winning the Gazette Player of the Year for soccer and field hockey, respectively. They and a bunch of other Northampton High all stores were honored at a banquet last month, so uh, you know, testament to their talent as well, and a thank you to our sports community. Thank you very much, Elena. Okay, next we move to a report from the superintendent, Dr. John Provost. Uh, this is a re an update on the first 90 days of inclusion. Good evening. As it should be clear from the title of this slide, this report is intended to provide a snapshot of our progress at the 90-day mark into our inclusion initiative. I think it's important to just draw some attention to that because it's not a snapshot of the first month or the second month. I think that's a time when we were at a very different place. Um, we've made adjustments to programs and we've made changes based on problems that we've heard discussed in this, in this venue many, many times. I want to point out that we are talking about the snapshot at this point in time rather than the 
snapshot in the beginning because I don't want it to be implied that if there is positive data here that I'm trying to contradict or negate problems that were experienced earlier on. Um, I think it's important in all of this to say that, you know, we're representing data. Um, we're trying to do it in a way that is as transparent and free from spin as possible. And I wanted to say that at the outset because I think that may set the, my hope is that that sets the agenda that this will be received with open minds and open hearts. I think I shouldn't have pushed that button. <laughs> okay, there we go. Put this here. Uh, I want to start by discussing um, some limitations of this report. Um, just to be clear about it, we work in a and live in a multivariate world, right? So this is not represented as an empirical study. There are a number of variables that we were changing all at one time. Any changes that you see um, are a result of the entirety of the changes of those variables. And the design here isn't such that um, we can track back any change in performance to any change that we made to the overall program. To give you some examples, we added an ELA coach in addition to um, moving to an inclusive model this year. We have no way of um, tracking back when we look at ELA data how much of that change might have been a result of the coach and how much of it might have been a result of a different model. We added a new math program. Again, um, we did that at the same time we made the change in inclusion. So when we look at changes in math scores, how much is due to inclusion and how much is due to math is an unanswerable question. Um, also, this is one of the most important changes we made. We made the change over the summer, which means that every student has a different teacher than he or she had the year before. Teachers are one of the major sources of variability in student achievement, and every single student has a different teacher. So we don't know how much of the change is based on the fact that they're all with different teachers. One of the things that we will do in most of the um, slides we look at is try to control for one of the other parts of variability, which is the students themselves, by looking at cohorts of students rather than looking at um, grade to grade in different years, um, which would be different students. Um, other um, limitations is students were not randomly assigned to one treatment or the other. Um, and if you're, if you're trying to get very precise about making inferences about effects that are attributable to causes, you would like to do that. This was obviously a, um, a change that couldn't be made blind to teachers, right? Because so much of what influences students' achievement is, stu is teachers' beliefs about um, students. And there's no way to um, create in this, in this kind of uh, situation a scenario where the teachers are not aware of whether or not students have disabilities. In fact, you wouldn't want that. I mean, in a truly empirical study, you would want the teachers not to know so that their beliefs would not be um, influencing the outcome in any way. Another limitation is this is what I would call an A-B question mark design. Um, when you're looking at trying to create an empirical study, you typically or one way you can do it is have a condition A, which is before, and then you have a condition B, which is what you're changing. And then what you really want to do is change back to condition A. Because then you would know if there was a difference while students were in condition B, that the difference is probably caused by whatever you were doing in condition B. No one ever does this in large scale um, situations like changing the model for a district, because if you feel that there is an improvement, you don't want to take that away in order to prove that what you were doing caused the improvement. Um, also, length of implementation. Um, this is a, a process that the training we've all received says takes about five years to get to its highest level. So at this point, we're about 10% of the way into that um, process. And certainly, um, we were will be able to do this with much more sophistication five years in than we're able to do it 90 days in. So 
this is really a policy study rather than an empirical study. We're just trying to evaluate the impact of the new learning conditions at this time without trying to make very precise judgments about what parts and what you can attribute to what's working or what's not working. One thing I did want to point out before going on um, is the measures. Uh, Ms. Bowen spoke in public speak about um, how we how we chose the measures and being very careful about looking at the measures that, that we're going to represent to, to get some estimate of student learning. I want to say that these measures are all measures that were developed as part of what we call a stakeholders evaluation that happens every spring. It involves administrators and teachers working together to decide what types of assessments they want to provide for students in the upcoming year. One of the reasons, uh, I wish there were more than the, the four assessments I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, one of the reasons that we don't have more comparative data going back is because that stakeholders group is always evaluating and redesigning the assessment system in order to make it, um, in order to improve it. One of the um, concerns it's had for a long time is trying to minimize the amount of assessment that students are exposed to um, because that takes time away from learning. So um, we have sort of we've narrowed it down to four measures that I'll be talking about tonight. So first one of those is Ames Web Oral Reading Fluency. Um, reasons for picking it, decoding speed and accuracy are reliable indicators of overall reading competence. It's not the whole story. It doesn't, ta it doesn't measure reading comprehension, but it's a very um, unique student who is very disfluent and also has a very high level of reading comprehension. Um, there, this is one of the most um, frequently used measures in um, estimates of reading ability. Um, there are about 32 different assessments, I think, in the me Mental Measurements Handbook um, around reading fluency because it's such an important indicator of overall reading competence. Um, so first grade reading, we don't have any cohort data because different assessments are given in kindergarten. At that point, we're looking at things like letter naming fluency and letter sound fluency. Um, but I did want to provide some first grade data, even though we don't have a cohort, um, to address the concerns that have been raised um, at first grade at Bridge Street School. So the first chart here is just comparing grade one oral reading fluency from last winter's benchmark to grade one oral reading fluency at this winter's benchmark period. Um, in all of these charts, the pre-wins condition, last year's students are, will be represented in blue, and the post-wins will be represented in red. Um, these, uh, these competence, in, or not these competence, these intervals represent, these five intervals represent the five levels of the test. So the zero, or the one to first percentile, is considered the well below average range. The 11 to 25th percentile is considered the below average range. The 26th to 47th percentile is the average range. The 75th to 89th percentile is the above average range. And the 90th to 99th percentile is the well above average range. These percentiles are national percentiles, so we're comparing our students to the entire national sample. Um, so looking at last year's first graders, this, this is a chart that does not make me feel good about the reading fluency of last year's first graders. The plurality of students were in the bottom 10% of students. It's a whole district. Um, you look at the, the um, results for this year, you can see that we took a large chunk out of the bottom 10%. We still have 25% of students in the bottom 10% of students on this measure, but the result here is strongly positive. We also have more students in the top 10%. And then the other thing you can look at is the median student. 
the student who is right in the middle um, last year was in the 34th percentile this year is in the 40th percentile so you see movement at the bottom movement at the top movement in the middle those again they're different students so this is the least controlled measure of them all you got different students um, go to different program you've got math you got, sorry ELA coach um, how much of this is a result of maybe these students just came in with a higher level of skill we don't know because we we're not controlling for that um, this compares Bridge Street to the overall district average in reading again it shows what um, what interval the students fall into um, it's really important when you're looking at all of these individual class and school charts to remember that you're dealing with small numbers of students in, at, at the school level you know so five percent of the first grade at Bridge Street is one student you know um, actually less than a, a student is more than five percent um, so just comparing here you can see that the data for Bridge Street more or less this year kind of looks um, like the data for the overall district last year. There's slightly fewer kids in the bottom 10 percent. There's slightly more kids in the 11 to 25 percent. There's slightly more kids in the above average range. Slightly fewer kids in the well above average range. Um, just letting you know how that met, how the students in the first grade look on this measure of learning. Next, we're starting to get into cohorts. So this is the same group of students as they went from first to second grade at Bridge Street School. Um, so again, last year's first graders at Bridge looked much like the first graders across the district. Um, you really had what's known as a bimodal dis distribution there. You have a peak of students in the bottom 10%. You have another peak of students in the middle. Um, what you'd really like to see is the highest peak being in the middle and then sort of cascading down on either end. Um, but I think this shows progress from first to second grade. Um, you see fewer students in the bottom 10%. You have some of those students who move to the 11th to 25th percent. You have more students in the average range. You have some students in the above average range this year. There were no students when they were in first grade. Um, and then there were slightly fewer students in the well above average range. The median percentile increased from the 23rd percentile to the 27th percentile. That's really important because that means that half of the group last year when they were in first grade were below average. They were either well below average or below average. Now the student in the middle is at least within the average range. This looks at the second to third uh, grade cohort. So again, it's the same students. Um, again, it's a positive direction. There, the median student increased from the 45th percentile to the 52nd percentile. So the student right in the middle of class went from being slightly below average in second grade to slightly above average in third grade. Um, there, are more students in the above average range, slightly fewer students in the below average and the well above average range. This is the third to fourth cohort. Um, this is a tiny increase in the median percentile. It goes from the 42nd to the 44th percentile. This is one where I have some concerns. There are more students in the bottom 10%. Really, it looks like what happened is that group that was in the 11th and 25th percentile split. Half of them went up to the average range, half of them went down to the below average range. Um, so, and looking at that, that's five, 10. So that's, that's three or four kids in the, in the bottom 10% that I would just encourage the school to think about maybe changing program for. Um, the fifth, fourth, the fifth grade, um, this shows a decrease in the median percentile from slightly above average to slightly below average. 
It shows moving kids from the bottom 10th percentile. It also shows moving kids from the top 10th percentile. So this is really a, a, a group of kids that sort of squeeze toward the middle. We'll see that and a few of the other di uh, distributions we take a look at. Moving to leads, again, um, as this is a cohort moving from first to second grade. Um, again, in first grade, had more than a third of the students in the bottom 10% of students and has shown a strong improvement as that group went into second grade. Again, this is a group where the median student last year was in the below average range, meaning that half or more of the students were below average or well below average as first graders. Now, the, the distribution is much more like what you would expect. The middle student is almost right on to the middle student in the nation. There is still a sort of negative leaning skew towards the bottom end with almost 25% of students in the bottom 10th percent, um, but it's progress. Next is the two to three cohort at Leeds. Um, here, it's basically just a little bit better. It, it's more or less the same picture, um, basically moving a few kids from the below average range to the average range and leaving everyone else basically the same. The median increases from the 40th percentile to the 46th percentile. Some of that is due to moving some students into the average range. Some of it might be um, also due to what's happening in that wide 50 point middle interval. This is looking at the three to fourth cohort at Leeds. Here the, the median percentile increased from the 50th percentile to the 64th percentile. Um, as you can see, similar numbers of students in the below average ranges. Um, there's a few less students in the average range, so it's basically a matter of moving some of the students out of the below average into the average, some of the kids from the average to the above average. This is the fourth to fifth cohort. This is a median percentile decrease from the 53rd to the 48th percentile. Again, it is a, um, like the fifth grade at Bridge Street, a group that seemed to move towards the middle. This is Jackson Street, first to second grade cohort. Um, again, in first grade, this, this graph looked almost identical to the Bridge Street graph in first grade and the Leeds graph in first grade. And they also showed progress from first to second grade. The median percentile increased from the 25th to the 42nd. So again, it's a group that had more than half or at least half of the students in the at below average or well below average range as first graders and now has the average, the middle student in the average range. Also would point out that um, in addition to removing students from the bottom 10%, it added students to the above average range last year in first grade. There were no students in the above average range. Um, now they have that. There are um, fewer students in the well above average range. This is the second to third cohort. This is a median percentile decrease from the 66th to the 58th percentile. Um, again, this is a, a chart that looks somewhat similar. You have m some more kids in the, the bottom 10%. You have some more kids in the 75th to 89th percentile. You have fewer kids in the average range you have fewer kids in the, the top 10%. This is a third to fourth cohort. Um, this is a median percentile increase from the 52nd to the 66th percentile. This is probably one of the most interesting cohorts that we've had this fall. Really what happened was that below average group when they were in third grade, the 11th to 25th um, percentile group split. And half of them went up to the average range, half of them went down to the below average range. But I want to talk about how that happened. 
because um, I did take a look at the individual students given how interesting that is. So when these students were in third grade, the bottom 10 students were reading an average of 39 words a minute, and the top 10 readers were reading an average of 161 words a minute. Using Fontes and Pinnell expectations, that put the, the first group at the beginning first grade level and the second group at the sixth grade level. This winter, um, the bottom 10% are now reading 67 words a minute, and the top group are reading 193 words a minute. Both groups added 30 words per minute to their scores. But the bottom group is still in the first, half, first grade level because you'd really like to get them up to 75 or 100 words per minute. Um, the top group now reading the eighth grade level. Um, so that, that is a group that, very interesting the way um, they sort of bifurcated there. Overall, it's an increase in the median percentile because of uh, more students on the top pulling up the average. This is the fourth to fifth cohort. It's a median percentile decrease from the 69th, 68th to the 59th percentile. There are fewer students in the bottom, fewer students in the top. Like we've seen in all the other fifth grades, it's a distribution that moves towards the middle um, while staying above average. Ryan Road. Here's one where we can't, uh, the Ryan Road first to second grade cohort is so small you can't produce um, percentile ranking for them. Because um, just to give you an example, if you had two students, it wouldn't really make sense to say one student is at the first percentile and the other student is at the 99th percentile. You need to have sufficient number of students to spread out the percentiles meaningfully. But what I can say is that first grade graph looked similar and in some ways worse than the first grade graphs for the other three schools. Here, um, you again, have most of the students in the bottom 10%. Um, but you don't have the secondary spike in the middle, really. Um, but I can tell you is as this group moved from first to second grade, we have 20% more average or above average than we had when they were in first grade. This is the second to third cohort. It's an increase from the 60th to 67th percentile. Um, it's really a group that had more students in the average range last year that was able to move some of those kids to the above average range. Remember, we're still it's Ryan Road, so it's small classes, so it's a few kids, but it affects the median percentile. Next is the third to fourth oral reading cohort. This was an increase from the 32nd to the 38th percentile. Um, again, you can see slightly moving down number of students in the bottom 10% more or less the same in the below average range, slightly fewer students in the average range, and your biggest difference is the 75th to 89th percentile increase there. This is the fourth to fifth. It's a median percentile increase from the 50th to the 55th percentile. Again, it, like the other fifth grades, is a group that became more average leaning just ever so slightly more in the positive direction. So this looks at all of the cohorts, putting them together. Um, we can't calculate a median percentile for the different groups because each cohort has its own percentile. But what you can say is taking all the students in the district, moving from first to second, second to third, third to fourth, fourth to fifth on this measure, there are 4% fewer in the below average range, there's 2% more in the average range, there's 2% more in the above average range, and in this chart, 1% is about eight students. So this shows moving about 30 students from one interval to another interval. Now, as I said, the measures were selected um, collaboratively with teachers. This is the measure that I think, um, I'm not think, I know this is the measure that teachers um, think is more meaningful than the, the uh, 
oral reading fluency information that I shared with you. This is not a fully complete data set um, because um, one of the methods we used in order to reduce over testing kids is we said that all students would be assessed in the fall using BAS and if the students were above grade level expectations we wouldn't reassess them in the winter unless there was some reason to think that there was um, there was a problem so these scores might have a downward bias the one thing we know about every student who shows up here is that they weren't making a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of instruction because if they were then they wouldn't be in that low enough score in the fall in order to be reassessed in the winter so this is the first grade at Bridge Street you can see that the uh, every one of these traces on this chart represents a student's progress from the fall to the winter the colored bands show you the expectations and on this chart we only go up to grade two expectations there is one student up at M it's kind of hard to see that is an end of second grade expectation I'm not exactly sure why that student was reassessed because they should have been exempt from the protocol based on their their fall score but that student was assessed so it's put in here anyways um, I would just point out since there's been so much discussion of some of the challenges of first grade at Bridge Street how many students came in at level A that's basically beginning of kindergarten or maybe mid kindergarten level um, so that's the point that that students had to be um, accelerated from so taking a look at all of the students on this graph again it's only the ones who are low enough to be assessed last year they made an average of a half a year's worth of growth in a year of instruction in the first 90 days this group has made one and a third years worth of instruction so this is a group that's on path to to gain more than two and a half years of reading competence in one year of instruction this is the second grade um, fewer students who were below going into the second grade they had gained about 70% of a year's worth of instruction, say seven months of growth for every year of instruction in the prior years. So far, this group has gotten uh, a year's worth of instruction on average, or a year's worth of growth, I'm sorry, a half year's worth of growth. So they're on pace to get a year's worth of instruction this year, or year's worth of growth. So um, accelerating that trajectory by about three months per student this is um, I think where some of the small numbers really start coming in so on Bridge Street in grade three there were only four students who scored low enough in the fall in order to be reassessed in the winter one of those students did show regression so this is a group that went from growing about a year in a year's worth of instruction to growing about seven months in a year's worth of instruction based on that student in purple in the bottom at Bridge Street, and there's no data for fourth grade on the BAS because all of the students in the fall were had sufficiently high scores that they didn't qualify for retesting. And this is the fifth grade. Um, this is, and in fifth grade, there are only three students. Um, they were growing in an average of six months per year prior to this year, and are growing at an average of seven months per year at this point. Um, Obviously, the number's got to get to one if we're going to close learning gaps, but 0.7 is better than 0.6. Next is Leeds. Um, so this is a group, the first grade at Leeds had fewer A's uh, at the beginning. Um, overall, there are some students here I think probably didn't have to be reassessed. They had they'd gotten about a year's worth of instruction on average or years worth of growth for years worth of instruction they in the first 90 days are showing a trend of about a year's worth of growth this is the second grade this group was getting about nine months of growth per year of instruction 
the average for this group now is one year per year of instruction. I, that blue one on the bottom is one of my favorite um, tracks in this whole thing. This is a student who was beginning grade two. So they had kindergarten and first grade, two years of instruction had gotten to level B. That's, you know, mid spring of kindergarten year. And now um, is mid first grade. This is Leeds third grade. Again, you can see kind of a pattern of fewer students being that far behind, which is good in and of itself, because it means efforts to intervene are, are being successful with fewer kids needing um, continued intervention as we get older. This group was growing at a rate of six months per year and is now growing at a rate of one year per year. This is the fourth grade. There are uh, more students here, obviously, than Bridge, who had none. This is a group that had 0.8 or eight months of growth per year. The small sample, but good results here, this group is now growing 1.3 years per year. And this is the fifth grade at Leeds. Um, this is a grade, again, where we had a student who regressed. That's a green, um, green line that went from P to N. So that, that shows this, or makes this group of six or seven or eight students um, decline from growing nine months per year to growing seven months per year. Um, but it's really about that, that student. This is Jackson, grade one. Again, there are a lot of A's coming into the beginning of grade one. This is a, and then there's a, and this one also a student who didn't have to be included. There was a student who was beyond M at the beginning and is now at M, so beginning of, or the end of second grade. Um, that one really throws this off. Um, so for what it's worth, the group was growing at a rate of about one year per year of instruction. The um, regression of that student and also some of the students, like at the bottom there, that A who sort of flatlined and hasn't made progress, makes this group grow at a rate of about seven months per year. So that's, that's a group to take a look at. Next is grade two. This is a group, interesting, you know, grade two now with A still showing up. Um, but again, uh, I like that blue line, like the student who's gone from the beginning of kindergarten to the beginning of first in the first 90 days. Um, so this group is growing at a rate of eight months per year and is now growing at a rate of 1.3 years per year. This is grade three. This is another grade where we had one student who regressed. We had one student who made no progress and four who went up. Taking that all together, it goes from 0.8 per growth per year to 0.7 growth per year. Oops. This is grade four, more students in this um, chart. This is a group that was growing eight months per year now growing 1.3 years per year. This is the fifth grade. This one is really uninterpretable, and this one may be caused by an inaccurate email that I had sent out. There were so many students in here who shouldn't have been assessed that it basically said they were the same before is after, because you see the W, which is grade six, the V, which is the end of grade five, U, T, all those straight lines going across basically swamped um, when you try to do any kind of a, an average, swamped everything else. Um, so just say uninterpretable chart. Um, this is Ryan Road. This is, uh, again, first grade, again, a group with a lot of A's. Um, this is a group that growing one year, more or less per year, to growing 1.2 years per year. Grade two, another one of my um, favorite traces, a student starting grade two with letter A is now reading at letter E. 
um, group that was growing nine months per year, now growing 1.2 years per year. Grade three, this is a group that was growing seven months per year, now growing 1.3 months per year. Grade four, this is a group that was growing eight months per year, now growing 1.3 years per year. Grade five, a group that was growing 0.7 years per year, now growing 1.3 years per year. So wrapping literacy up, um, on the measure of oral reading fluency, the median fluency percentile increased in 11 cohorts and decreased in four cohorts. I, I choose the median, but I showed you the whole distribution because you can see that it's, um, uh, there's a lot more going on. Every single student in that cohort is changing scores. And to try to represent an entire group of students by one student score is, um, I think, unfair. Um, but that being said, that median score has increased in 11 and decreased in four. The average percentile increase was 9.9. .9. It's nearly 10% in the 11 groups. In the four groups, the average decrease was 7.8, um, so three quarters of a decile. Overall, there were 4.6 fewer students below average. Now, looking at the BAS and just the below grade students, 26 showed more than a year's worth of growth in the first 90 days. 118 showed exactly one year's worth of growth in the first 90 days. 165 showed a partial year's growth in the first 90 days, but that's okay if that partial year is 0.5 or better because we still have half the year to go. Um, 13 showed no growth, seven declined. Um, so change in the weight of growth, if you do this sort of unweighted, it would be 0.8 to one, so eight months to a year, or if you do it weighted, meaning that you assign more to the schools where there were more students, it goes from 0.9 to 1.2. Either way, it looks like students are on a trajectory that's getting them about two months more worth of growth in a year's worth of instruction. So first grade math, again, we have no cohort data. We're only including this um, because of the concerns at first grade at Bridge Street. So remember, unlike the last bunch of data you were looking at, these are not the same students. This is the district wide picture. Um, and this is one of the measures we're using. It's math fact fluency, sorry, math fact fluency, one digit. Um, the percentile remains, the median percentile remains 36. Um, overall, slightly better. Remember, here small differences do matter because this is looking at the group of about 200 students, um, so um, meaningful. The reason that the, the per median percentile remains the same is this is not a very sensitive measure. Um, in other words, the difference, um, that whole 26 to 74th percentile, I think is scores of three, four, five, and six. Um, you know, and so it's, it's not a very, as compared to some of the other things we're looking at, not as sensitive of a measure. Uh, then this looks at grade one math fact fluency at Bridge Street compared to the district-wide average. It's not much different. Again, the green bar, 1%, or sorry, 5% is one kid. This is mass fact fluency tens, another one of the measures we use. Um, here, we, one of the things that remains, you know, it's a conversation I'd like to get to at some point, is what can we do about moving students out of the bottom 10%? You know, in the pre-wins era, 30% of the kids were in the bottom 10%. In the post-win era, 30% of the kids are in the bottom 10%. That's a group that we need to get some progress on. However, I will say that we did move the rest of the students up. If you look at um, from 
the pre-wins to the post-wins, there are fewer students in the average, more in the above average, more in the well above average. But again, percentile remains 50 um, because what you have is sort of the weight on one end of the, the distribution um, balancing the weight at the bottom end of the distribution. This looks at Bridge Street on this same measure in the comparison. Um, so here is a, a measure where I would say Bridge Street fares slightly worse than the rest of the first grade in the district. Um, but again, by how much? It's a, it's a difference of about two students in the bottom 10%. It's you know, a difference of one student in the above average range. Um, it's a, it's not a huge difference, but definitely a difference that favors the district over the first grade of Bridge Street. Um, this is a third math measure we use, number comparison fluency. Again, it's not a cohort. Um, and again, not very sensitive. Uh, you see there are differences. There are more students in the average range in the post-wins era. There are fewer students in the um, bottom 10% but not enough to move the median. The median is still 31. And this is how bridge looks um, compared to that. So here's a student where, or here's a situation where Bridge Street has fewer students in the bottom 10%, but it has more in the 11th to 25th percentile. Um, doesn't have any students in the 75th to 89th percentile. Um, so I think it's slightly worse than the average for the district not a lot worse than the average for the district. Um, okay, so now we can talk about other measures that we use. These are ones that carry through from first to fifth, so we can look at cohorts. Number sense fluency, um, why we look at that? It's a predictor of calculation fluency. Um, deficits in number sense are at the core of many learning difficulties. So if a student has poor number sense, um, it's a indication that that's a student who may need more support. It's also a practical measure for progress monitoring because we have multiple forms we can give the student um, repeated measures on it without having a practice effect come in and, and um, confound the data. So this looks at Bridge Street from second to third grade. Um, so again, now we're starting the same groups of students. This is a first grade that was increased from the 64th to the 66th percentile. Um, this, I think, with everything else that has been called out, I'm going to say this on a few schools, but this really, I think, is a time for Bridge Street to shine. You know, here you have two thirds of the students in the top half of students. Okay, um, this is third to fourth. This is an increase from the 56th to the 70th percentile. Um, can see nice movement from the average range to the above average range. This is Bridge Street, fourth to fifth. Increase in the median percentile from the 59th to the 72nd percentile. Um, again, fewer students in the bottom 10%. Um, there are fewer students in the top 10%, but many more students in the above average two intervals and fewer students in the below average interval. This is Leeds. This is a cohort that went from the 50th to the 50, the, where the median went from the 50th to the 61st percentile as the group went from first to second grade. Um, this is the one sort of blemish on this graph is there was an increase in the number of students in the bottom 10%, um, but sort of the offset of that is there are also more students in the top 10%, and there are also almost no students left in the 11th to 25th percentile. This is third to fourth. Um, here's one that showed a very strong push towards the middle. Um, the median remained the same. What happened is you had fewer kids on the edges. Um, really, you had e almost equal number of kids going from the 11th to 25th percentile up and going from the 75th to 89th percentile down, they all meet in the middle and stay right around the 61st percentile. This is the fourth to fifth cohort that leads. 
This is a percentile increase from the 66th to the 82nd percentile. Um, so one of the things that I want to point out about this is you almost have as many students in the top 10 percent as you have in the average range. Um, you also have the median student in the above average range. This is sort of the opposite of some of those things we looked at earlier when we're looking at reading fluency and it was bimodal at the bottom 10th and middle. This is bimodal at the top 10th and middle. This is Jackson Street looking at the same measure, um, second to third cohort. Increase in the median percentile from the 59th to the 61st. Um, you see what I would consider to be modest improvement there, moving some kids along from the 11th to 25th to the average range to the above average range to the well above average range. This is third to fourth. There's a decrease, um, hardly detectable, from the 59th percent to the 58th percent. Um, again, it's it's a one of the charts where you do have more students at the top and you have fewer students in the 75th to 89th percentile. So really the whole game here is what's happening in the middle and that's where most of your students are. So that remember that middle percentile is wide. That's 50 percentiles there. Um, and the average student within that is staying at about the same place. This is the fourth to fifth. This is the second one where we have the median student moving from the average range to the above average range. Um, and I also want to point out that it has move, moved almost all of the students to the above, to the average or above average range. There's one little bit of red left in that bottom 10%. This is Ryan Road, second to third. Median increase from the 72nd to 75th percentile. So it was a group that was already strong, became a little bit stronger. Um, another group where the median student is in the above average range. When they were in second grade, they were almost in the above average range. Third to fourth. Um, again, this is a group that shows a move towards the middle with hardly any change in the median percentile. There is, a, there is a nice drop in the number of students who are in the bottom 10%. This is fourth to fifth. This is an increase from the 68th to the 86th percentile. This, I believe, is the first chart we've seen where the plurality of students is in the top 10% of students. It's also one of the many we've seen now where the median student is in the above average range. And this looks at all of the all of the cohorts. Again, we can't give a median because every cohort has its own median. You can see same number of students in the bottom 10%, but it's important that it's less than 10%. It was last year and is this year too. There are fewer students in the 11th to 25th percentile, more students in the average range, fewer students in the 75th to 89th percentile, more students in the top 10 percent. So uh, numeracy summary, 11 of these 12 groups are showing an increase in the median percentile rank. Overall, 5.3 percent fewer fell below average and 3.6 more fell above average. Now I want to make a transition um, because another um, concern that has been brought up at Bridge Street is school safety and school environment. Um, so this is the data looking at just office visits, nurses office visits at our four elementary schools and all these charts. The last bar is the, is the total. So this looks at August 16th to mid-January, I think it's like January 13th or, or somewhere about there when we were putting this data together. I believe there may be one or two more days in um, the current year than there were in the prior year because we started earlier, but it's basically the same number of days. Um, so you can see the only, the only school in where the number of nurses' office visits increased 
was Leeds. Um, and you can see the overall decline when you put all four schools together. However, um, this is just office visits. That doesn't tell you very much. Um, students visit offices for all kinds of things. They, they visit the office to get medication. They uh, visit the office because they're hungry and they want a snack. They visit the office because a tooth falls out. You know, there are, uh, not because someone knocked it out, but because there are a lot of baby teeth falling out. Um, so looking at the number of office visits involving an injury, um, you can see that there is a slight increase at Bridge Street School and there are slight decreases at the three other elementary schools. Um, however, you have to go a level deeper than that because there are many different kinds of injuries. Right? Um, people slip on the ice. Kids get stung by bees. Um, you know, people get hurt at recess playing games. So one, one measure, um, you might want to look at some of the, and we have, I'll say we got a 28-page nurses coding um, report that they fill out. 18 of those pages are all the different kinds of injuries you can have. Um, so I think it's important to look at ones that sort of inherently involve issues of safety. So one of those is, was there a nurse's visit that was caused by a fight? Um, obviously, that's clearly student-on-student -student violence. Last year, um, the only place that happened was Bridge Street in this first few, uh, four or five month period. They had four injuries involving fights. That same time period this year, they reported zero uh, injuries resulting from fights. You can see that the f other four elementary schools had no, none of those types of injuries in either year. Um, another um, type of thing, less um, probably significant or severe is poking. Now this one is a little bit um, sort of shaky because you could unintentionally poke someone, but that a lot of the poking is happening intentionally. Um, you can see that there were nine, visit, nine injuries from pokes last year at Bridge Street, 12 this year at Leeds, 29 to 25 at Jackson, 33 to 26, Ryan Road again, as yeah, the smallest school, um, has the fewest of those, did see a slight uptick in pokes at Ryan Road. The next, and this is the one that, you know, in my opinion, is the one that I've always found sort of most difficult to observe, are um, injuries involving human bites. So last year for the first five months at Bridge Street, there were 10 reported injuries involving human bites. For the first, that same period this year, there was one. Um, see, that's similar to Leeds, which had one, and Ryan Road, which is spiking a little bit on that, so that's something to, to look out for. So they have six this year. I would say that, you know, on this, many times, this represents the behavior of a single student. Um, you have students who, who will go through periods of biting and be responsible for, you know, I would, I would be surprised, although I don't know for sure, I don't have this access to this level of detail, I would be surprised if that represented 10 unique individuals at Bridge Street last year or six unique individuals at Ryan Road this year. I would suspect that has to do with behavior of one or two students. Um, another thing you can look at is the severity of injury. Um, now, concussion isn't necessarily something that's severity uh, indicating, and it's not something that in really has um, implications necessarily for school violence because students get concussions for all kinds of reasons. Um, they get concussions playing on the playground, they get concussions falling off the monkey bars, um, but concussions have been, in the, have been in the media and have been part of the discussion, so I felt it was important to give that data. So last year, there was one concussion reported in the first five months of school. This year, one concussion as well. Um, Jackson Street had zero last year, one this year. Ryan Road had two last year, zero this year. I will point out um, on Leeds's report, it said eight, and I called the nurse and I said, what's happening there? I haven't seen any injury reports. She explained to me those were all concussions that happened outside of school, 
that she was collaborating with the physician on and just monitoring the student. So she said she felt it was um, appropriate to list that as zero rather than eight. Um, another indication of severity can be, did the student have to be sent home due to the nature of the injury? Last year, uh, there were eight students who had injuries severe enough to be sent home first five months, this year two. Leeds had 11 last year, 14 this year. Jackson Street had two last year, zero this year. Ryan Road had four last year, three this year. And then the last, obviously um, an indication of severity, visits or injuries severe enough to require a student to be sent to the hospital. Um, there was one at Bridge last year, one at Bridge this year, zero at Leeds last year, one at Leeds this year, three at Jackson last year, zero at Jackson this year, and none at Ryan Road for either year. Um, so just talking about overall impressions, uh, again, I can't say how much of this is inclusion, how much of this is coaching, how much of this is new curriculum, but I can say the combination of factors seems to be having a net positive effect on student learning. Although it's not every class, it's not every student, but when you consider a policy affecting a thousand students, the direction is in the positive direction. Interestingly, the strongest literacy improvements are in the early grades. Um, that part, I guess, isn't interesting. That's what I would expect because we know that the early years are the prime time for growth. What did surprise me about this is the strongest numeracy improvements are in the later grades. And I don't know why that is. Um, it's just interesting. Um, and, you know, the number and severity of injury reports is down in the aggregate for selected types of injury. I can't say that um, our data produced for us by our nurses um, supports the idea that students are being injured at any higher rate than in the past. So, as I said, we're 10% into this. Um, we've made many changes already, and by the time we get to the five-year mark, I'm sure we're gonna make many more changes. But when I look at what the biggest challenge is for the next 90 days and possibly beyond, these are what I see. The first is balancing advocacy and inquiry. Um, I feel that the equilibrium between these two modes has kind of been thrown off. Every person has an unconditional right to advocate for anything, but unrestrained advocacy really shuts down the ability for people to hear each other. Um, and so I, I think one of our challenges, based on where we've gotten as a school community, is moving the advocacy volume down and moving the inquiry volume up um, so that we can be more engaged in conversations that are gonna inform the next 90% of this journey. Next is fostering reflection and generative conversation. Um, kind of related to the first. What we really need to do, I think, to create the next 90% of this journey is to engage or increase our capacity to engage in reflective practice with ourselves and reflective practice with others. Um, we have seen different iterations of this in the first 90 days. There have been um, a lot of discussions where some groups, I'm not pointing out any group, I'm just saying some groups because this has happened on all sides, have said to other groups this is what you should do. And that hasn't led to a lot. There have been other groups that have said, all right, what can we change to try to make things better? And in general, those, those processes have been generative of more solutions. A third is improving the relational environment, what some people call the social fields. Um, one thing that is obvious is that there are places where emotions are raw 
and where re relationships have been strained. And when you see that, you can't see people performing at their best, either the employees or the students. Um, what can change that is people becoming more grounded, um, which is difficult, <laughs> difficult for all of us. It's been difficult for me through this. Um, but I think that's an important part. I mean, if so, bringing, for example, as I as I like to talk about this, bringing your best self every day, um, even when it's hard, that's that's a real challenge. I think in the next 90 days. Next, um, <coughs> shifting from reactive to creative problem solving. One of the criticisms of the interventions we've done at Bridge Street this year is that they've been reactive or reactionary. <coughs> I agree. Um, getting out ahead of that, that sort of cycle is really important in the next 90 days. And I think that begins with the budget discussions that will start taking place in this room in two weeks. But I think probably the biggest change is recognizing that problems out there are in here. This is, you know, what I think of every time I hear people saying, you know, we could be so much better if it just, if it was just for, if we could just get rid of this student in our class. Or we could do so much better if we just didn't have this negative teacher in the school. Or we could do so much better if we just didn't have this principal. Or we could do better if we didn't have this superintendent. Or if we just changed the school committee. Um, I believe a lot of those conversations have happened. I'll admit to participating in some of those conversations. I think all of that has been 100% wasted energy. Because I think the only thing we can do to move this process forward is all own our own part of the problem and all own our own part of creating a better solution. Um, so that's, that's where I, I sort of see the work and where I frame the work for the next 90 days. I think that um, <coughs> the start has not been without difficulties, as you've all heard, but I think the indicators we look at for student achievement and student behavior are positive. I'm very confident that when we get to the end of this road in five years, um, you're going to have a system that is much better for kids, much better for employees, much better for all involved, but it will take time to get there. Do we have questions or comments uh, for the superintendent about the presentation? When you look, when you showed the student-on-student -student injuries, is there a significant um, student self-injury? Self-injury is one of the, the codes. Um, I don't think that we had self-injuries reported at any of the schools. I'm not 100% sure. I do know, I am 100% like sure it's one of the codes. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Um, yeah. It's fine. Um, I'm still digesting, thank you. It was a lot of information and interesting. Um, a question I have for the, I guess for the literacy data you showed and some of the groups of kids performing at the lower end, especially the zero to 10%, at what point um, does it, does it, and how does the process go to say, okay, maybe this child has an undiagnosed learning disability. At what point does that sort of process begin and who initiates it? So that is our RTI process. It's, RTI stands for Response to Intervention. Um, this whole assessment regime, except for the BAS, was put into place in order to help identify those students and start providing interventions for them. Uh, you probably heard us discuss Title I reading. Um, those are the types of supports that students would start to receive when they, when they note that um, that sort of discrepancy. So that, again, may be another factor um, that we're not controlling for. Most of the reading intervention is provided in the first grade. Um, and you see, in most of those groups, there was a big difference from first to second grade. Um, we didn't separate out kids who received Title I for kids who didn't receive Title I, so we can't, um, can't answer that question. 
And then the, the uh, philosophy of, re of response to intervention is af if after receiving the intervention, the scores don't improve or the performance doesn't improve, that becomes a student that you look at as possibly needing a further evaluation in special education. You know, it is one of the things, though, as we think about, you know, how that happens and where that happens. We have, as a district, made a decision. I mean, this is a collaborative decision with teachers to not start that process until first grade. I think because of an interest to not um, Im involve kindergartners who might not need it in an intervention. Um, but we saw a lot of first graders who were starting the year at level A, right? So, you know, that could be an adjustment. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the all the data on injuries, uh, I guess I, I'm not a nurse. I have no clue how many injuries kind of that aren't as severe go unreported or maybe aren't aren't severe enough to have the kid come to the nurse's office or to fill out an accident report that kind of the types of injuries like a bump that just involves from from an environment. Um, do you have a, is there any data on that? So we have specifically chosen to go with nurses data because we think it's the most reliable. Um, you heard someone reference the uh, school council meeting that took place a few weeks ago at Bridge Street School. One of the teachers who spoke at that meeting said, I don't think our office referral data has any reliability. That was, an, and what he said was he'd been told that increasing the numbers was a way to get more resources for Bridge Street School. Um, there was also a whole, uh, I don't know if I call it a debacle, maybe it's a debacle, mm -hmm. certainly a dispute at Bridge Street School about what the incident report should be, what should be on it, um, which led to a lot of confusion around you know, the types of incidents that were getting reported. So we basically just felt the one piece of sort of standardized training data that we have that is also relevant to injuries are the nurse reports. Um, so that's why we went with that. Dr. Provost, you, you mentioned uh, during the presentation that, that you've made adjustments through the 90 days, you know, that, that from starting from the beginning to where we are now to the assessment. Could you kind of maybe just summarize, like, what are some of the adjustments that, you've, that have been made along the way? We have uh, redesigned schedules, both at Bridge Street and at Jackson Street. Um, I would say that that process probably took place in October or November. I would thank Josh Dixon, who's here tonight, um, who met with teachers and administration at both of those schools to um, rejigger teacher schedules to um, both add support in classes where um, needs were greater and also to uh, make sure that all IEP goals were covered. At Bridge Street, we added two, oh, and, and also at Jackson Street, we added an ESP from the unemployment savings we realized. at. Bridge Street School, we added two staff. Um, one one uh, is working in the first grade class. Another one is sort of split between fifth and kindergarten. Um, and there we also did do a, a number of changes of schedules to try to provide support in the areas of greatest need. Um, the other, the other uh, change that I guess I would just say sort of at both schools has been sort of rethinking this process. I think I said it at one of my earlier meetings that the schools that seem to be having more success earlier are schools that built schedules from IEPs rather than sort of scheduling in a traditional way. And so we tried to sort of back into that at, at both Bridge and Jackson Street. So given that we have, you know, two narratives, Narratives. Um, have you given any thought to bringing in perhaps a visiting committee or, or experts from outside or from another system who have already implemented an inclusion model to provide us with a third party's view of what they see is going on and maybe even to give their guidance based on their prior experience? Um. I would say that there's probably more than two narratives going on. Right. <laughs> you know, there's multiple narratives going on. Um, I have not given a lot of thought to that. What I have given more thought to is the idea of staff within the district who are meeting with greater success 
going into places where there seems to be greater need and trying to share that because in that scenario we're, we're um, working from a framework of people who all have similar resources at their disposal. Um, it's not that I'm opposed to that, um, but I, I just think that the visitations we've been able to have from other staff within the district have been really uh, meaningful. I mean, they've led to changes in the way staffing's being done at Bridge Street now. Um, and I, I would throw this out. I didn't add this piece of data, but related to the, inc the, um, the issue of safety, I gave the, the workers' comp claim information at the last um, meeting. I checked with HR today. There have been no new workers' comp claims related to student behavior in the last month. Um, so I think, you know, and, and, you know, that was January. That was a long month. We had some holidays and we had some uh, snow days, but for the most part, it was a full month. So I think that process has been fruitful, and I would like to try to encourage more of that. Ms. Fallon? Um, the number sense fluency gains from fourth to fifth grade district wide are kind of amazing. And I know you said that you didn't figure out what that was. Do you plan on maybe investigating exactly what's happening? I mean, I, like it's it really, I mean, going from 59 to 72 percent, 66 to 82 percent, 63 to 75 percent, 68 to 86 percent, like in all four elementary schools from fourth to fifth grade, I it seems. Like if there's something specific that's causing such gains, maybe we want to figure out what that is. I would like to know what it is too, but I don't want to perform the experiment to find out because the experiment would be that you start withdrawing things until you find the thing that makes the scores go back down and then you know what it was. Um, I have a suspicion I'll never be able to prove because as I said, it wasn't a controlled experiment. Um, the biggest thing we changed in math was the math curriculum, you know? And we changed from a curriculum that wasn't aligned to a curriculum that is aligned. Uh, I think that probably has a lot to do with it, but I, I don't think we'll ever know for sure. Other questions, other comments? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Provost. I do have a question. Oh. I'm so sorry. Ms. Burnham. Actually, Is this going to be available for people? Yes, it will. So it'll be posted on the it'll be posted district on the website. website. Yeah. So people can Figure return it. to it. Okay. Um, Next item on the agenda, uh, this is a vote. This is the approval of a $55 pay rate for a Leeds after school uh, piano teacher. Um, and I believe uh, Principal Kanata is here to speak to this item. First table sitting. Leaving. Thank you for hearing me out tonight. I, uh, before I, I begin, I did send a letter out. I'm assuming that's in its packet. I do have a correction to make in that letter where the sentence says that uh, our students have the opportunity to get two hours of instruction for six weeks for $60. We actually changed it over to eight weeks. So it's an eight week uh, time frame for the, the LEAP class. So getting right to, I suppose, with a few points before why I'm asking for this is. I have some good news first, and good news is that right now, as we speak, over 200 students in grades K to 5 are involved in our after-school program. That's two-thirds of our entire student body. So they're there after school and, and growing in popularity. Um, the offerings range from what we call our early bird and late bird, which is childcare, to enrichment in art, sports, knitting, Legos, yoga, computer, dancing, cartooning, crafts, foreign language, which include both French and Chinese. Um, and it also would, it provides an incredibly inexpensive option for families and a chance uh, to earn extra money for our staff, for some community members. And more recently, we've uh, increased our staff to have NHS students who are, who are teaching in our after school program and making a few dollars for themselves, which is wonderful. It, wouldn't, it also is appropriate for me to recognize Shannon Daniel. She's an ESP, works in our kindergarten, uh, was involved in early bird and late <coughs> and she took over LEAP, the enrichment uh, part. And uh, 
like I said, expanded it to 200 kids. So she's done an incredible job bringing in new talent, um, new people, and bringing the existing students in our school to the after school. So this session, and, and Shannon does a good job recruiting and reaching out and trying to find different people. So this session, the, the, the uh, instructor, Zuli McBride, uh, she, was t she teaches Chinese, which I think is an awesome offering in and of itself. Um, she's also a piano instructor. And she approached us to, to be able to, to teach piano. So <coughs> understand that the rates are fairly well set. Um, but in this, in this case, I'd like to present that the early bird and late bird child care staff are earning about $25 an hour for two hours. So they make $50. The LEAP instructors uh, make about $40 per class, and they work around an hour and a half. Um, so she actually has a private business where she charges about $60 per hour per student. And she's right now uh, working with six students, like I said, for eight weeks. Um, so I asked for a slight increase over what the child care providers in early bird and late bird are getting because it's a specialized skill and I think it's not quite fair market wage but I think it's fair and just to back that up um, looking up some local piano teachers if you were to go elsewhere there's <coughs> one I found again I went to Craigslist and among other places but um, $25 for 45 minutes for kids age 7 and up which turns out to be about $50 for an hour and a half um, there's another one closer by where it's 10 lessons for $250 and again ours are getting eight lessons for $60 so I think she has a specialized skill I think it's fair market and I'd like to be able to offer a slight increase to keep her in school and increase uh, the interest in the after-school program any questions any, uh, a motion perhaps Motion to approve the $55 pay rate for Leeds after school piano teacher. Second. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. sure. I know it's not um, How much more will families have to pay? Or nothing more? Nothing. Just, there we go. Same. Okay, it's yeah. the same for everyone. Okay. Any other questions? I, I do have a question. If we're changing this here, how do we decide when we change it for something else? Right, I know it's Somebody this else is. Somebody deserves that. I understand that. I figured that's that. I understand that you prepared I, I it. Wanna, um, I, I wasn't sure how, how to answer that. <laughs> no. um, I mean, it's the elephant in the room. <laughs> it is. Part of it is she approached me and you know, says, I'm, I'm getting this here and I'm getting this here. Mm -hmm. And I kind of met her where I could. I have another question. Okay. The kids who have access to this piano lesson, are they kids who are required to do something outside of the class that they need to have a piano? That I don't know. I think there's a range. There, right now there's six kids taking the course. Um, I believe one has a piano at home, so they're all brand new to it. You know, it's an exploratory, and I, th I, don't, think, I don't think there's one beyond second grade. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you very aye. much, Principal Kanata. Oh, okay. All right. <coughs> um, okay, so we're going to move. Um, I'm actually going to ask if we can move up item number F, which is a bid to award the transportation contract. Um, we do have a representative from the uh, company who's here with us. So um, I wanted to turn it over to Ms. Walzak to just lay the, lay the foundation for that. Yep. So as I've outlined in my report to you, we opened our bids a couple of weeks ago for the next five-year school bus contract. Um, I was happy with the bids that we got. As I've outlined, we received four bids, which is in the school bus environment is a lot of bids. Um, if you look around the state, most states, most schools are getting one or two. We're lucky if they get three bids. So I think we were very advantageous to get four very competitive bids. Um, the difference between the low bidder and the second low bidder in year one, which was about a uh, $941,000 contract, the difference from the first two bidders was $893. Um, and even the spread up to the highest bidder was only about $80,000. So that tight spread indicated that we really had some competition. Pencil sharpening. <laughs> um, 
Overall, to our pricing, it reflects, so there's three components of this bid. The NPS home to school transportation, which is going up about 5% in year one. The Smith vocational transportation, which is actually dropping by 1%. And then the athletic transportation. And that had quite a change this year. We listed a lot more schools for athletic trips so that we had the cost identified up front. So what we found were a lot of the trips went up about 5 to 8%, and there were actually a couple of the new trips that are to the out-of-town areas that actually dropped substantially. Uh, the athletic director reported one of those is about 40% less than she's paying right now. So there was quite a spread within the athletic range. Um, the contract is for 11 buses, nine for us and two for Smith Volk. This contract required the buses. If you remember, I came back to you several months ago and asked you to agree to some broad parameters. It asked that the buses be no more than 10 years old and have 150,000 miles at any point in the contract. The low bidder has, has agreed that they will start the contract with seven brand new buses out of the 11, and the remainder, remaining four buses plus the spares will be newer than what we have now. They won't be brand new, but they will be newer to us. And if they reach the 10-year point during the contract, they would have to be updated also under the terms of the contract. So state law does require that we award the bid to the low bidder. So I'm here tonight to recommend that the school committee award the bid for the next five years of school bus transportation to Durham School Services. And here tonight to say a couple of words, I think, before you vote, if you're receptive to that, is Stephen Schmuck, who's the Northeast Regional Manager for Durham School Services. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, Durham School Services, we've been uh, your, your partner for the last uh, several years. Uh, we've really enjoyed uh, providing the transportation services safely and hopefully as efficient as possible to you guys. Um, we look forward to hopefully providing those services for you for several more years to come. We certainly have a lot of uh, great uh, technological advances and innovation that we bring forward. Uh, we've got some great things that we're uh, providing that will even be greater than the specifications that you guys are asking for in the future regarding uh, safety, uh, monitoring of uh, the roadways and, and certain <coughs> of our drivers. And I believe our drivers do a fantastic job and our staff does a fantastic job now, but we want to ensure that we continue to provide that for you going forward. Uh, certainly the camera systems that we're going to put in are going to be night and day mode, camera, audio, video, uh, multiple cameras per bus. Uh, so there's a lot of great things I think we're going to provide. And certainly I just want to make myself available to all of you and see if there's any questions or if anything you had. I have to ask a question. Sure. Because Sam Hopper is in the audience. <laughs> stop. What about stop arm camera technology or stop arm violation detection? So that we'll have camera systems that are actually in the uh, bus that we can put excuse me, put multiple camera systems into. What we can do is there's an exterior mount camera that can be put on the outside of the bus that will tie into our recording devices. And that can be pointing in one direction. It's not like the uh, third party vending systems that are out there where they have like a call center or a dispatch where they're observing those things and then trying to ticket through the state agencies. That's not what it would be, but it would be recording and hopefully be able to capture any kind of license plates. We also have in the past um, in other uh, districts had a mounted it in the dashboard area of the vehicle looking kind of diagonally out the windshield so that if a driver or anyone sees uh, something occur, we can capture that information, that footage, and you'll be able to see hopefully which, you know, the direction of the, as the vehicle passes. So that is a possibility and with, we can work with you guys on where those placements need to be. To clarify, in the bid specs, because the state law has not been changed, that lets any ticketing happening. Our specs did not require the stop arm cameras, but there's language in the contract that says once the state legislation comes through, that we can negotiate with Durham to see what we want to add on, if anything, to those. So it may not be there on day one, but once the state passes legislation, we can talk about whether we want to do it. Okay. And our city council uh, endorsed uh, that those uh, cameras, interestingly. <laughs> <laughs> Just as an aside. Head of the state. Yeah. <laughs> All cameras are not. I have to go on the record. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions or comments? So, um, the minimum two percent cola is that is that because there's an alternative minimum two percent or CPI for Springfield or how? So we changed the specs this year. Rather than having the contractors set the rate for the future years, I had given you a comparison on the last contract that showed going with a CPI index would be better. Historically, has been better. So the current thinking is rather than have the contractors. You shut your ears. <laughs> Try to guess what the COLA is going to be in the next couple of years, because there are some years at zero or one percent, but they've got driver increases, insurance increases. 
um, that guaranteeing a minimum of 2% can possibly avoid them front loading the first year of the contract. So if the CPI actually goes up 3%, they'll get the 3%, but if it goes up one and a half, they're guaranteed 2%. So they could build that into their first year knowing something would be coming for the next four. It's, that, it's a strategy. And the CPI doesn't have a cap, though. There's no ceiling. No, there's no cap. It's a federal index, though. No, no, I know, but I mean. For New England. But if it, if it gets bad, it gets bad. It's just the, so we're going to cross our fingers. That, yes. But the last two years of this contract, to remind you, had 6% increases. Yeah. So hopefully it won't be that bad. Any other questions or comments? I would need to have a motion to. Uh, Sam, to one, just one question. Uh, Ms. Walczak, I, you did some preliminary budgeting. Um, knowing that this was going to be a cost that was coming uh, to build into the the budget that we'll be working on is this th are these numbers in line with what you expected or are they coming in higher or lower the number for next year is actually substantially lower than what i had put into my first round of budget projections so as we're finalizing the budget we'll be coming forward with i was actually able to reduce that number the timing of opening it let us get a real number into the budget I make a motion um, to award the bid to Durham Transportation contract. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So congratulations and Great. look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda, well, we'll actually go back up to uh, item D. Um, we have a report from Rules and Policy Subcommittee, and I'll turn it over to Ms. <coughs> Chair. Um, okay, uh, the first thing that I would like to point out is that um, Policy IKF, uh, we are asking for this to be both the first and second reading so that we can vote tonight on a change in graduation requirements. Um, the timing then would work out that if if the change were approved that it would be able to make it into the program of studies. Um, so Principal Lombardi did come to um, the committee um, after discussions with department chairs and um, the school council and wanted to recommend that we um, that all students take at least one course in um, visual or performing arts. So we are um, asking that the subcommittee is recommending that you amend the graduation requirements in policy IKF to read um, one visual or performing arts course worth one credit as designated in the program of studies to be effective for the class of 2022 and subsequent classes. Um, and as I said, we were hoping that both the first and second reading so that we could vote tonight. I know Principal Lombardi's here. If you have any questions, I'd rather he answer them than I. Then may I, um, I'd like to add that I think the, if you, the, the reason for as designated in the program of studies is because this visual or performing arts thing is kind of writ rather large in terms of it includes, um, includes the woodshop, um, Woodworking classes, working. Uh, all the theater classes by Mr. Eldridge, um, audio video um, by Mr. Whalen and other cl his classes, so on. art classes, um, try to go very, very wide um, from the fine arts, performing arts, um, and um, the visual arts. So that's why it says, as designated in the program of studies, as opposed to trying to define that in the policy. Do we know how many students were actually participating, uh, taking a course like this as an elective anyway before making yes, a requirement? We ran um, numbers for, um, for two years, and we had about um, 20 students per year that did not do that over their four-year career. And so we, so we feel this is cost neutral. This won't add, um, add any more. This will require funding for us. Um, one of the things that we'll be talking about in the future budget is we are looking to have some increase in our, our um, Band teacher, so that will be something that will naturally absorb this. Hopefully, the budget goes through. So again, um, and that was tied into a separate decision. So this should be something we should be able to absorb um, without any cost to additional teachers um, and g having students explore some different possibilities in the high school curriculum. So you don't feel like this uh, new requirement is taking away from a student's ability to take some other course that they might 
miss because they have to fulfill another requirement as you stated most students are taking one of these courses yeah, I mean I, th I think you're always potentially I mean high school's choice you know and um, mm -hmm. I think some students come I had actually a conversation with Elena, um, a couple of days ago that some students come very early and they have their whole high school career planned out you know by the end of eighth grade you know they see the program studies and that's a combination of our classes and college classes etc However, out of 32 classes that you, you take, about 16 are required. That's still leaving about 50% of um, elective-based courses. Elena. Hi. Um, so I really wish that I could provide some student feedback on this. Um, unfortunately, because it has been so sped up in the fact that the first and second reading are on the same night, I really truthfully have not been able to get student feedback on this, and I think that's regrettable. Um, I think the fact that there hasn't been an opportunity for student or community or graduate feedback in this is unfortunate. Um, you know, I think that, yes, I did speak to Mr. Lombardi about the fact that, you know, high school students have the chance to take 32 courses. That's it. And, and yes, 16 of those are electives, but if you factor in full year APs, of which there are many, um, if you factor in for some students learning strategies courses, which take up you know, maybe two classes a year for some kids. If you factor in ELL courses, um, a lot of kids want to take Smith courses. And our high school offers so many electives. Um, you know, right now I'm participating in so many amazing history department electives. Um, there are math department electives. There are electives in every department. Um, I think, you know, if we're making the argument that it, it's cost neutral, only 20 kids didn't take them, if that's it, why, what is, why are we making this a requirement? I think I would love to hear more about that. Um, I think that high school is about choice and I think what the Student Advisory Committee presented to you tonight too is about expanding choice for our students. Um, so I think from my perspective I, I would have liked to be able to get more student and community feedback on this um, before we decide. And I, I understand the point that um, this needs to be included in the program of studies. Um, however, I do, I do hope that the committee considers um, carefully adding this. Um, additional requirement for our students. Ms. Buzanski. I just uh, want to kind of piggyback on what Ms. Fragamini said. It, it, in, so I'm curious, so this didn't go to the curriculum committee? It did go to the curriculum committee met? Oh, no, I'm sorry, not curriculum. It went to curriculum. policy and curriculum yeah. did not. I mean, it just feels like last year we added the history requirement and, you know, I'm, it's unfortunate we're discussing an arts requirement because I am, you know, very much for the arts and so of all things you know in this very you know kind of arts you know creatively rich you know place that we live in Northampton it seems kind of funny that we haven't had an arts requirement but I do kind of just cons I'm concerned about the overall number of requirements that were sort of have now laid on and what you know Ms. Frogmini was saying about choice and I think it's becoming hard you gave a lot of great examples I'd like to add those kids who take two maths per year to you know I mean we just have a lot of kids who are who are left with very little so um choice we didn't add history requirements they've always been three we, we changed what the courses were but but we didn't add any more in terms of the amount that they needed to take Right, but we determined which three courses they would take instead of before they had one course yes, it, plus two yep. electives in history. Which they, to they me would say kind of more choice. They, they, can, then, they right? can take electives, but I think it was much more educationally sound than what the history department was recommending in regards to. I agree, to I voted for it. For a specific set of content. Uh -huh. I, I do think there is a, is a piece uh, as educators that, um, first of all, this does align us more with the Mass Corps, which is recommended um, coursework for graduation which I think the superintendent brought that up maybe two years ago, um, that w should be a, a goal that students uh, you know, mm -hmm. graduate with the, the required um, core classes that the state feels is appropriate um, for well-rounded education. And I think the educators, we are making you know, informed decisions of what, what is in the best interest of our students. Shouldn't we also be at some point saying that we do think it is important for students to graduate high school having taken at, one, at least one class in four years that exposes them to something in a visual arts experience. At some point, should we, is that important to us in, in the values that we have for our educational system and the community of Northampton? So again, that, that's, that's what I'm throwing out. I think that that's where this came from um, at the high school. People feel that this is something that we value, um, that it does enrich students, that I think one of the things that I hear a lot about is a lot of stress that students are under 
And at what point do we try to, to diffuse some of that stress by having other opportunities to explore things they might not because they feel they're under the pressure to take a, a, a course load of all AP courses in Smith. And at mm -hmm. what point do we say, listen, high school is a very unique opportunity, unique time in your life to explore something that you might not, and you might actually find something that you have a skill at or an interest that if you weren't asked to expose, to experience it, you might not have otherwise. Right, I, and I hear you. I, I'm really talking less about the art requirement and I'm talking more about adding more requirements in general and what the sort of big picture is, not what this specific picture is. And I just wonder what the, the rush is to not give it a chance for a you know, second reading or to get student feedback or for the curriculum committee, for it to go to curriculum committee to look at what, so that's all, just questioning that. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight something that Ms. Buzanski was saying in, in terms of the history requirement. You know, I don't think anyone on this committee is debating that the history requirement that you all approved is necessary and fantastic, but it did, there were three required courses, so it now takes one more course before a student can take a history elective. And I think if we're talking about electives in general, and we're not specifically talking about arts, we're talking about ability to take electives. Um, you know, that was a requirement that pushed it a little further to when a student can take an elective. Um, so for me, you know, I'm focused on student choice and being able to take electives as a whole, not specifically on arts. So I just wanted to highlight that point. Ms. Fox. Um, I want to echo what I'm hearing here and just express the idea that the student choice is really important. And I also hear that we're trying to align ourselves with the mass core. Um, and I do agree that this has felt fairly rushed in terms of not having more community input or curriculum subcommittee conversation about it. And I, I think there's even one more layer. My understanding is we're also not in line with the mass core requirements in foreign language. And if that becomes part of this discussion over the next year, that's another two classes that we might be asking to be required going from 16 to 19. And to me, the part of this I understand right now, it feels like that all should be part of the same conversation and we should take a more holistic view of this whole thing that can be done um, this quickly. Mr. Moore. Yeah, I, I, this is a very general point, but I think that where this discussion for me leads is towards this question of whether we should reconsider the number of courses that are offered, or the number of class periods in a day. Um, you know, that if you, if you want to be able to have certain things that you think everybody should be exposed to and you want to be able to give people plenty of choices to do other things, it's really hard with just four classes per day, uh, four classes per semester, which it means in some cases, you know, just maybe only six or seven classes for the year. Um, so I think it leads towards you having to think about that, and that's obviously a big, huge, long-term <laughs> conversation, um, but maybe it's one to start thinking about. And then the other thing I would point out about this, that, um, one of the impacts that comes up about making this a requirement is that it makes the arts less likely to be the program that is on the chopping block when um, in what is it now two years when we are when we are having to spend out of our reserves um, and have nothing left one of the reasons in the past that the arts have been the, the this thing that gets cut is because of all the departments at the school it's the only one that is not something we require people to take and so one effect of this is essentially to um, have a policy which prevents that from happening. And I, and I actually think that's a very positive thing for the school and for all the students in it to have a policy which says, no, actually we value these enough to say that we aren't just going to have them there as the thing which we see as some sort of an appendage that we can lop off when we need to save a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, so I think those, that's, those are my two points about this. Mr. Meyer, then I'll come back to Ms. Bisansky. So I understand the desire to have choice, but I also think that some of the things that are most valuable are not necessarily our choices, but things that we are required to do. So 
when I went to the University of California, there were <coughs> breath requirements. So students could arrive even farther along in their education having already thought about, I'm going to be a chemistry major, but they were still required to take courses outside of their major. And I don't know of a university program that doesn't do that. Um, I think high school, you're even early in the educational process, and I think it's really valuable to ask students to be, to expose themselves, not out of choice, but to expose themselves to experiences and parts of education that are not their strength and that are not their choice. Um, and I, when I look at this, I mean, I understand that from the process perspective, we could say, let's take more time. But the way our schedule is currently configured, can we require less than one course? I don't, I don't think we have that option. So, you know, and also to Mr. Moore's point, um, if, if we really feel like these are, and I, again, I've sat here when we've looked at cutting arts at high school, and we've talked about core courses, core courses, core courses, and then there's this other stuff on the edge. And again, if it is, as our community tells us, whenever we propose cutting the arts, they come in and they tell us quite loudly, this is not the edge. This is central to our identity as a community. So why, again, if we're the school committee and we're supposed to be reflecting the values of that community, why wouldn't we incorporate this in our program of studies as one thing that you as a high, again, one course, and again, as Mr. Morris pointed out, this is not visual or performing arts strictly that you have to be in concert band or that you have to be you know in a theater class but it's really seems broadly conceived so that students would have a wide variety of choices um, so yes they would be constrained in choosing an arts course um, <coughs> but it would be a pretty broad menu um, so I, I mean I understand from a process perspective it might be great to spend another year on it um, but at the same time I, I think it has a lot of value to, to move forward now um, before I come back to Ms. Busancy, could could you just um, explain the, the Common Core for people who may not Mass Core. Mass Core, rather, and just like, because I know, isn't Phys Ed part of the conversation? It is, too? it is. Or um, the other things you mentioned when you came to the district that right, we don't so, require so, Phys Ed either? I don't have my Mass Core sheet in front of me, so I think I could talk about the pieces that are missing to get to Mass Core rather than all the components that are in Mass Core. Um, but oh, beyond that, I'll just say this. Uh, not only was it shocking to me that Northampton High School did not have an arts requirement in a community that uh, I perceived is valuing the arts, um, it, it also is shocking to me that Northampton High is one of the few high schools that hasn't aligned with Mass Corps um, of the high schools I worked in. Um, because that is an agenda for excellence, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know why we're telling students it's okay, you don't have to take foreign language when we know they're going to be living in a diverse society with individuals who speak other languages. I don't know why we tell them it's okay to not take a foreign language when we know a lot of them are going to want to apply to post-secondary education that has an expectation that they've had a language experience. Um, so to get to, get to the, the pieces of Mass Corps that Northampton was missing, it was really three. Um, the first was phys education, and that is the most financially difficult. Um, interestingly, it was the piece that we took on first because it also is the one that's required by law. Um, the only subject that we're required to offer to students is physical education. Every, and not only offer it, but students have to take it every year from kindergarten through 12th. Right, Sharon? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we uh, have been in the process of building out some form of PE experience. I know that it's been somewhat controversial in how we've done it, but at least getting um, <coughs> some PE experience for students in grades 9 through 12. Um, we were starting with basically two, three staff members that together didn't equal even a full-time, two full-time equivalents for almost 900 students. Um, so that was obviously the biggest reach. Um, this one is probably the smallest reach because as Mr. Lombardi said, um, most of our students are already taking something that would fall under this requirement um, without a mandate to do so. Uh, the language piece is one that I think is a little bit hard to predict. Um, my gut tells me that that probably would require additional staffing if we wanted to do it. It also um, would provide some shielding um, 
as we discussed with the arts, um, technically right now we could <coughs> cut language programs because it's not a, um, not a graduation requirement if we were in a financial strait. Uh, but I don't know how that, that will go necessarily because I know of at least one local high school where when they aligned to uh, Mass Corps for foreign language, they found that they didn't need additional staff. Um, so, um, and I'm, so, you know, I, Mr. Lombardi brought this up, I think not really within the context of Mass Corps. I think he brought it up because his faculty said that, you know, they felt that it was an important requirement for the students. Um, I think that if we do do this, then we're very close to Mass Corps. Then, you know, it's the language requirement, it's a discussion that, you know, will involve some controversy because it's taking two more blocks out of the schedule. Um, it may be a requirement to take some money, but it would be the last remaining block that, that keeps us away from aligning with the Mass Corps. And that's not a requirement to align. I mean, it's not. Okay. Um, Ms. Busansky, you had your hand up earlier, but then I'll. So, so I'm just curious. What is what's the rush? I mean, what if it did not go into this year's program of studies as a requirement? I mean, only we're talking 20 kids who don't take an art class over their four years. I'm just curious. I don't think we have a reason for a rush. I, I, we brought we brought forward and we and we came. I guess tonight is because we have the program of studies. But in terms of okay, okay, thanks. Because uh, we're, we're, we're voting on the program of studies for yes, yeah. And, and by the time that we I brought this forward and we had time to you know, arrange a meeting, this all the kind of the calendar worked out. Ms. Fallon, can I just? Um, ask you I know you spoke with department chairs and that you did you you did go to the school council and there is a student representative on the school council I would just like to say that I was not there oh you are the representative <laughs> it was the one meeting where I left half an hour early due to an <laughs> impending snow day <laughs> so oh, I that gosh. is sure I, I don't want to interrupt your comment but oh no 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 it was just uh, like I don't think <coughs> this is the type of I, I mean I feel like the community has made its position clear every time that there's been a cut I mean this room's been packed when they were going to cut band or you know what I mean like people clearly feel very supportive of the arts in the community and you if you do have the support you're saying of the department chairs not just in the arts but all yes of them, yeah it was brought up yep. and of the school council and I feel like like we don't, I, I, I totally get what you're saying, um, but I also feel like that we don't need to take a vote of the students for every decision that, that we make as far as curriculum type questions are, are concerned. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, um, and I would like to add in terms of what Mr. Moore said that, um, you know, for, I mean, we are also aware that we need to take a healthy look at our, at our, our schedule, but that is not something you rush and I can't give an overnight answer to so that is something that um you know we've put out we're requesting through um, some grant funding that we are you know we're going to take an active look at that for a variety of reasons to best support our students you know for choices and to support them in the classes we need um but again that that is driven by m many factors but i just wanted to share that because that is a good point right. and and i remember asking you on subcommittee that was it a particular group of students that was opting out of it? Like, was it really high achieving students that it would cut into their, and you said that there was really just a kind of a random grouping of kids that were, you yep. know, that small group, 20 to 30 students that were opting not to take yep. an art store in there. Okay. <clears throat> I really like this discussion and thank you for, you know, your passion always <laughs> around this. And as somebody who hated to be told what to do, um, I appreciate that um, it's interesting to sort of look at this change and kind of the veils that uh, kind of pop up when we talk about it um, as somebody who was required to take three math classes in high school that was the worst for me so my first veil is like right on arts I'm an artist I want everybody to take art art is like an essential part of the development of the brain I we go through K through eighth grade taking arts. And, you know, I will speak, you know, I'll speak, my kids aren't here, but my kids are stuck taking requirements that they could have spent the entire 
four years doing arts? Um, you know, these are choices and it's values and it stinks that we get told what we have to do, but we are told what we have to do, like, a lot. And I don't know that an arts class is the place that I really <coughs> feel is like where I, I it's, that's a hard one for me, I'm gonna admit. Like, I want student voice, I really, really do. But, but I, I mean, I look at what any kid who is not comfortable in academics has to do at the high school. Um, and having an arts requirement just doesn't seem I don't know. That's my statement <laughs> of passion. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Ms. Hennessy. So I'm, and you know this, I support this so much. Um, and for similar reasons, except I'm really awful at art. <laughs> but I love it and appreciate it, and I feel, I feel like it's valuable. The one thing I do want to point out to all of us, though, and you said it, we do value student voice. And we value it enough to put it students here and on the um, school councils and what I don't want to say is except now because we know better if if we're hearing from students that we don't they haven't been heard and the one place is student school council and we haven't had public comment and we're rushing this then while I'm beyond supportive of this I think that we then have to say we, we also value student voice and we're doing it in all these other ways in our community so I for me that's where I'm weighing my decision, and I don't, um, so, period. Yeah. Elena? Um, I just want to touch on a few points. Um, to Ms. Fallon's point, no, you, this committee does not need a student vote on everything. However, I am here, and no, I don't have a vote, but I am here, and I am here to represent students, and quite frankly, I'm saying that I can't represent students on this vote because I haven't had the ability to talk to them. And I think this committee knows from the events over the past many months that decisions go better when there's a chance for public comment and there's a chance for reflection and there's a chance for community voices. And quite frankly, I don't think this has happened. And, and the other point I wanna make, I am so not against arts. I haven't even had the chance to think about what an arts requirement would mean. In my brief re meeting with Mr. Lombardi, it sounded really great. It sounded like we are expanding the opportunities for our students in arts, that we're expanding course offerings, that we're diversifying course offerings in arts. But I quite frankly can't represent how our students or graduates or the people who experience Northampton High course offerings feel about this. Um, I think to Ms. Burnham's point, on one hand, yes, there are so many students who have, are, are required to take those math courses where that's a really hard requirement for them. At the same time, I have students that I've briefly had a chance to talk to who are so motivated in those math courses and, and really, you know, yes, we, we are to Mr. Meyer's point. There are requirements and requirements can sometimes be really hard, but this is not just about, you know, oh, it's, it's really hard to be told what to do. I think this is about how our school system values what we want our students to learn, but also if we're thinking about what we want our students to learn, shouldn't we also be thinking about how students think about what we want them to learn? I think it's a two-way street. Um, I think those are my main points. You know, I'm, I'm on this committee to represent students and quite frankly, I, I can't on this decision. Well, well. I, I really want to say that I super value student voice. <laughs> and I appreciate Anne bringing that up. I really, really, really do. But I look at the course requirements and I'm like, was there student <coughs> voice to say that you needed three math classes or two world history classes? I bet that would fail if you took a I know, but students. I mean, what, what student is going to be like, yes, I want three math. No, but quite frankly, there wasn't a student <laughs> union when we, when we had that. And I think. That's an important piece to consider in this, but. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I mean, I, well, um, for one of my daughters, I didn't have any problems getting them to take art classes. It was trying to get them to take something other than art classes. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that there are, well, I guess I'm gonna sort of lean more towards Mr. Meyer that, um, uh, that sometimes it's, that choice is good and we're providing half choice, you know, 50% of it, the curriculum would still have choice. Um, but I think it would be good for some students to 
particularly those who might feel that the only way I'm going to succeed is if I only take the courses in the concentrations that I'm interested in um, and take, you know, uh, so I, I actually I actually support the idea of trying to make sure, and, and you know we are what best small arts town in America, and we have invested a lot in our in in visual arts and the arts and music. Um, and I've been at those meetings when people have come to say, "Why are you eliminating? Why are arts always the first on the chopping block?" So you know, um, I'm I'm supportive of this. I'm, I'm supportive of this. And I don't and I you know I don't know that uh, we have to wait. Um, to take a vote of the, of the student body on it, because the student body that's going to take a, a quarter of them aren't going to be here next year for um, for that new curriculum. Other people want to comment? Um, so, I want to also say I think for me the importance of the arts is the reason to move ahead with this. But I am still wary, and I'm still digesting it. Um, when I first heard about this proposal, um, and Mr. Lombardi knows this because I asked him, I was really worried that if this was required of every student, maybe we would have to cancel some higher level arts classes so that every student would have that one art experience because I didn't know the numbers. And then I learned it is only 20 students a year who aren't meeting what might become a requirement. And that's a really small number and it. There's so many classes that can absorb those students, it's not a big deal. And so then it felt a little bit better. And what I'm learning now is maybe this is a way to protect the arts moving forward if it's a requirement. And that's new to me. I hadn't thought about that before. And I, I think having some time to, to have public comment on these sorts of decisions, even though we all value the arts so much and we live in this community that values them, feels important. And another alternative to this might be to say, let's have that conversation. I don't think it's going to even be a very long conversation. And maybe vote for the class of 2023 soon so that this is protected and that it's required and it's part of what we're doing. But right now it is feeling a little rushed without input from everybody to me. Ms. Fallon. Um, I don't I don't mean to say that I don't value student voice but this decision when I the way I was thinking about it is that your voices are representing your opinions but this doesn't affect any of you it would affect future classes and so while that's valuable I don't know that that should be a deciding factor by do you know what I'm saying so so I just wanted to be clear it's not this won't affect any of our students who are currently enrolled right it would, it, it would be for future students. Um, so that was the first thing. And then the second was, I think that I'm also not, this sounds ridiculous, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that I'm giving this the sense of permanence maybe that everyone else is in that I've been on the committee not even four years and this is the third graduation requirement change we've made. So I don't think of this as an, like a, going somewhere that we can never f fight our way back from like I feel like it you know if this works out that we've made a bad decision it's not something that can't be adjusted in the future <laughs> so I guess maybe that's a bad way of thinking about it but I'm just saying it, this isn't this isn't something that I think of as like a life or death decision I think of it as a, an important demonstration of what we value um, and I don't I don't know that's I guess that's why I was willing to to let it go through two readings tonight. Ms. Hennessy. So I feel like there are two questions, the process and the, and the, the graduation requirement. <coughs> so I, I feel a tug from all of us on that. And so for me, we're doing a different, pro I, I so support this. Like, yeah, exactly. But it's the process yeah. that feels icky to me and so, that it's about student voice and it's also about quickness and public comment. So those two things are real for me. That's all. So Let's start I, I do like to say that I, th I think we followed the same process with this as we did for history. First and second reading on the same night. Well, I, well, well in vote. terms of, I'm not sure so, how yeah. much student, I guess, uh -uh. that part w was mentioned for history. I could be wrong. It, it was rushed because we had the joint meeting of curriculum and rules and policy and then had to mm. separate out to vote. Yeah, I mean, I thought to it. Bring it. I think that was the part that happened. That was quickly. rushed. Yeah. Okay. 
I, I guess my point is person. is that you know I think that there are going to be elements that the, the people that are you know voted in and hired to, to make certain decisions I, th I think it, it ha that are educationally sound that are representative of the, the, the value system of the school as well as you know the guidelines of, of the state and I think that this seems to be one of those just like when we, when we discussed last year the history you know I think that was a very educationally sound reason why we changed that yes and we gave up some electives and maybe some people would say we're losing the electives but there were, and, and I, I would expect a lot of people to say I want more electives but on the other hand you know the, the the educator had to say but wait a minute that's taking away what we're the, the mission of what we're trying to do and I just wonder if the mission of what Northampton High School is about or even the district are we trying to expose our students to be well-rounded students um, is it also representation of the community that we're in and I do believe the arts and music and theater is a big part of that I've been here 10 years and I believe there's been at least two two overrides connected to that um, and I, th I think it is a valuable part <coughs> mr. Meyer um, so having lived in Northampton for 13 years I know that we love our process here um, and, and have served on multiple boards in the city um, I understand that process is often something that that we um, fall back on at the same time there are some decisions that for myself as a representative of the people in my ward I don't feel like I need a tremendous amount of process and in this case I again as a, as a teacher at a high school that has four sciences required I would get a lot less business if there was no science requirements but I also know I live in a society that faces perhaps the defining problem of human civilization and actually having public policy change to affect that problem is almost impossible because of the scientific illiteracy of our society so I you know even if the students stood up and said nope we hate it 99 percent we don't want this I would still say in Northampton I think we should move ahead with it because we do have a role of reflecting values in the community and sometimes it's coincident with what students want sometimes it's not and so that's why you know we could go on with more process but I honestly don't think I would come to a different decision and so that's why I'm ready to move forward with it tonight because I don't see talking about it for another six months that I would come down on the side of no arts requirement at Northampton High School Ms. Fallon back to the chair <laughs> could you please um, just tell like honestly how would it impact you that it wouldn't make it into the program of studies and that would be the problem by if we were to have a second reading and I honestly don't know what would happen between now and next month that would change 28th. this conversation but but would that mean that it couldn't go into effect for next year's class 27. yeah we, we wouldn't have for yeah I mean we're, we're gonna go to print with the program of studies we're gonna be going to um, JFK which would be the class of 2022 so it would put it off for a, a year and, 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 Voss and then Ms. And I think it also sends a message. so so um, I'm gonna, I just want to follow up on Ms. Fallon, Fallon's question is it possible to put an asterisk next to it saying pending second reading of the school committee and I'm pushing a little hard on this because I too value this and want to vote for it and for me it is about the process and allowing people to voice things that maybe we haven't thought of and I agree that it's very unlikely our opinion is going to change but is it possible to put some sort of asterisk there saying pending approval or just to to do this you know that I mean, that, that's what the one the version you have has that so I'm, I guess we have, is that okay policy wise the, the two Dr. we've never yeah when are you going to JFK we start that um I think the first week in March so we have Our a next meeting. Meeting is the 27th. So if it were approved at the meeting on the 27th, would that give you enough time to at least make photocopied tear out sheets for the eighth graders? You tear off the sheets? I'm saying you, you can't produce an entire handbook in three days or however many no. days. But could you 
get information that was relevant for the incoming eighth graders. We could do some, yeah, done. if that's what you want, if you want to have a vote for that, and <coughs> I tend to agree with Howard, but that's what the committee wants, I will make it work in that sense. It's really, I'll figure out that mechanism for having something in there that is, depending on people that come in and speak the word, we'll, f we'll figure it out. Um, if that's what the committee is recommending I do for an arts requirement in Northampton. Mr. Zahowski. So I'm trying to understand process myself and trying to understand what I already know to make an informed decision. And so I'm hearing from Mr. Lombardi that um, only 20, 20 students are not fulfilling the requirement right now. And it was for the last two years, each year, yes. If I was to speak to um, every other student that participated and took a class, what would they say? Because if uh, Ms. Fragamini is going to go back and gather information and try to determine whether the student body would support a change like this, it seems to me that there's a fair amount of students that have already participated in taking an arts and therefore it seems like there's support for um, uh, individual student education by election to participate in one of those courses. So um, although I understand the opportunity um, to ask and converse and go through process, I guess I find myself in the area of just reflection on what I already know based on past experience of our students. And it seems like the majority of students are electing to take one of these courses. So I would find it very surprising that if we ask the student body whether they wanted to participate in an elective course for a requirement that they would say no, if only for the fact that they would be able to make that decision for themselves, that they might elect to say we don't want it a requirement. But historically it would show to me, based on what you've shared with me, that the majority of students support the idea of taking an elective and if taken it and probably had a relatively positive experience. So, you know, I'm comfortable with voting to support the change this evening. <coughs> Mr. Busansky. Well, I just wanted to say, I think it's, um, I, I'm not sure how much will change between this meeting and next, if we waited till next, except for that, I think Elena could bring us back, not a student vote, but just information from the student body but my bigger I am all for adding an arts requirement my bigger concern is just looking at requirements in a holistic manner and if we're talking about adding a foreign language requirement or two no 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 I, 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 I don't that think that anywhere? should even be okay that's not even discussion at all so okay. I think it was shared about the mass core okay well I guess what I'd like I, to I just say want to be careful that I don't okay. want to get getting out because that's misleading that is it is on all. TV so okay good yeah. thank you for that correction I guess if we were to move ahead and add another requirement of any kind, I feel like it would be incumbent upon us to take a look at just requirements in general at the high school, the bigger picture, not the one particular so, requirement, yeah. to make sure our kids have choice. I think choice, the high school is the first place that our students get to have some choice, get to take electives, and I think we really see the you know benefits of that. So I can absolutely agree with you, and I can tell you there is, there's no, um, agenda or motive just to add requirements for the sake of requirements. Of course, but, there, but there is, without a doubt, and, and I think this is where the, you know, school should be or organic in a sense of growing. Just, I, I think the history discussion last year was great. I think that is what education should be. They were taking a look at what is it that we're trying to educate for students to have a sense of the world history and the U.S. history. And they really took a look at what are we turning out? What is our product? And I think at some time that's a healthy discussion that the educators should be having. Not necessarily to add requirements, but it might be to take a look at the course load that you have. You know, in Downey's situation, at his school, they require four credits. You know, and, and, and there's value to, a dis to that type of discussion. And maybe what were the courses and the reasons for that. I, I can say that we're not actively pursuing that. We certainly want to have choice. And when I go over the program of studies tonight, you're going to see that there's a lot of choices being offered for our students. We're adding more choices. We're not adding requirements. We're adding choices. But at times, there's going to be that, shouldn't we have a foundation of something we want our students to experience in content, skill, and growth and of interest and passion. And I think that's where the acquired classes come out that we say, you know what, we want you to have choice, but we want this foundation. 
because we <coughs> value that in, in regards to, again, the content, the skill development, and the passion. That's what I think this is about. But when I go over the program studies in a few minutes, you're going to see that there's more electives for students, more choice involved in senior um, in English um, and in um, science. And actually, in, in science, yes. Thank you. Burnham. So, um, thank you. Uh, two things. I think that um, as somebody who's on the curriculum committee and we couldn't meet because none of our schedules aligned, um, that that was a very different process than last year when we met for the world history. And we could be in a room with the teachers um, and hear them. And it is different and this process is not the same and um, I will agree that I liked the world history process more even though we were we were combining it so that we could get it on the um, because the teachers were passionate that we needed to put it on and I think that um, I do sometimes need to look to the experts the teachers were who are saying this is good. I assume that this is, I mean, you seem to be saying that this is coming from the teachers. And, yeah, um, uh, you know, when my editor yes. says I need to make changes on a book, I need to, th she's the expert. I sort of, I, I do feel like I need to listen to her. We can have a conversation, and I'm bummed that we couldn't have that conversation. I'll just yeah. say that. Um, so that is different. And the conflict, as Anne was saying, is, and a couple of other people, is simply that the process got truncated um, from a, I, I think from a place of, um, you know, respect and love for the arts and looking at our community and something that it values very, very much. So I, I feel like if a mistake in the process was made, that's hard and uh, we can name it and then sort of move on. Can I just ask a second point though? Yeah, no, yep. Culinary arts is here. Is still on this piece of paper unless I have an old one. Yeah. And I I was hoping that maybe culinary arts would be included that, in the arts it, it, it uh, still had offerings that course. Yes. and would love to encourage yeah, <laughs> having culinary arts. But it's it is on your piece of paper that you sent us. I'll have to check and I think it's on the one the one that I have, the revised yeah. 2818 this is addition. proposed IKF graduate yeah, that's, environment. That's incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. But I would love for the culinary arts to be in the arts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I think we all like culinary arts, but no, no, that's um, unfortunately, that, that's a misprint. Um, and I, I think I would like to say that the teachers that support this from Ms. Leary, Ms. Jaffe, Mr. Whalen, Mr. Um, Eldridge, Mr. Melnick, I think they would argue that their, that their courses are also, um, there's, there's value, not, and it's not just art for art's sake. I, I think sometimes we get stuck in kind of just saying, <coughs> and we lose the importance that there is the, the thinking and the processing and the, and the problem solving in those classes, you know, they, they cross over, they tie things t together. Um, and I think that that's, for some people, that's an opportunity for students to really have some of those hands-on experiences that they might not be getting of the same skills that we want them to have. That's a place that they can play out as well. Can I just ask you, did you fulfill the requirement? Did I fulfill the requirement? Yeah. Yes. In my many, sophomore many year, <laughs> I took American Popular Music and Social Change. Jeremy but how about all the how about all the yes. courses with with Jeremy Will? You, did you take Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um yes. So at least a couple times over you. Um yes. I have taken communications and media production three times and took it as a fifth course um last semester for those of you who want to know my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a lot of my spaces have been filled. You might want to think about branching out from that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then you might not get the transcript. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Just oh, go ahead, Ms. Well, I, I guess I have a question. I mean, we're we, we're going to have a fourth reading on something that we already know what we're going to vote on later, right? A naming of something. <laughs> like I, I just <laughs> six that's readings. The policy. You no, I, we can change that no, policy tonight if you want. No, I love. I hate <laughs> processing. This is the the ironic thing. If my wife is watching this, <laughs> laughing at me, because I. <laughs> but if we have this policy of first and second reading, that's what I don't, 
like there's a benefit to it supposedly or <coughs> not so that's why i just want someone to say no we could do it all well, in one day that's what i want there is a benefit to it but you know the city council also has the same the same policy they also will waive it when necessary and they'll make a mo motion to suspend rules if there's a deadline you know because if there's a deadline and usually if it's a highly controversial issue mm -hmm. it will not be done and somebody will object and mm -hmm. say no and i would think you know if the majority of us felt strongly that this was something that was going to divide the students and again i think mm -hmm. what mr zahowski says about the fact that people are voting with their feet in a sense Right, all but 20 students are already doing this. So even if that group times three came in, so you know, so that's just the question. I mean, instead of art for art's sake, is this process for process sake? Like, would we really come to something different? And, you know, when we say, well, Mr. You know, Mr. Lombardi, you'll just do stickers on all those, you know, 200 books that you're going to hand out. My thought is, why am I making my administrative, you know, staff? do extra work, because I'm pretty sure Mr. Lombardi has other things to do than copy tear-out sheets for this <coughs> thing. So I mean, again, I think it's, yes, process is important, but if, you know, depending on how you feel about how controversial this is, I would think that tonight we could make a vote. If it fails, it fails. Okay. And then we do it again. Yep. Okay. With that in mind, Ms. Fallon, would you like to make some kind of a motion to be chair? <laughs> I'm afraid to talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I move to um, approve policy IKF as amended. Second. Okay. And, um, okay. So, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? I do have a question. Sure. Don't we, don't we don't we need to move to suspend the rules? Probably we do. Before <laughs> we can have this to, vote? If you're moving to a vote, yes. Oh, I thought we were just going to vote twice. Uh, no, that would not be. Uh, <laughs> that would be a city council. Change thing. our vote. <laughs> so, the parliamentarian <laughs> to make a. Yeah, I mean, I'll make a motion to suspend the rule that requires the second reading. This proposed policy. It lo basically allows you. You can't vote until the second reading, so we, we only take one vote here, but okay. So there's been a motion to suspend rules, and there's been a second. Any discussion about the motion to suspend rules? So are we voting on the motion right now? We're voting on the motion to suspend rules in order to get to your motion to be able to vote on it. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to, um, actually I'll tell you, I think I, well, I'm going to vote against this motion, and the reason is not because I believe in procedure for procedure's sake. <laughs> But, but, but because I believe that um, procedure is important, not because necessarily it changes the outcome in the end, but because it provides a space for actually process, you know, for people to talk about things, to discuss things, to think about things. And, and even though it doesn't maybe change like the other bottom line in terms of the yeas and nays at, at, at the final vote, I think the, the the substance of those conversations is actually something that cannot happen in the absence of that process, and so th that's why I think I'm going to vote the way I do. Even though, again, no disrespect intended to you and stickers, um, <laughs> that's not a, it, that that's not really my focus there. Yep. Okay. So. I like I like to make a comment. Um, I feel the same way, and right now sitting here, everything I've heard, I'm very compelled to vote for this requirement, but I do think there's other people out there that need to have their voice heard, and I don't feel that it's detrimental in the long term to delay it by a week and a half and let them have their voice heard. So. I think I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. I don't know why I just feel <laughs> on the rules. Yeah, just because my hearing's not good. So I'll just go right to that. Sorting out, counting the A's. Ms. Zinke. Nay. Ms. Allen. Yes. Ms. Hennessy. No. Mr. Meyer. Yes. Mr. Moore. No. Ms. Fox. No. Yes. Come on, roll break. I know, and I'm going to say no. Yes, I love art. Yes. 
Just think. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yes. Have you read my books? <laughs> okay. So the motion to suspend rules uh, fails five to four. So that therefore the only thing we could do tonight is a is a first reading, which is just the discussion that we had. So that means that the second reading would take place at our next scheduled meeting. The actual vote would take place on the 28th. 27th. 27th, excuse me. At the budget meeting? Uh, it, would be at the, it would be at the, it could be put on the agenda if we wanted, unless there's Should any objection. No, I just wanted to be clear, so the. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any do other, uh, yes. Do we need to do any formal amendment about the culinary arts, or is that? Take that out. Well, I think we can do that next reading. Yeah. yeah, I think we're not there on the agenda. I think that's a different document. So, well, no, no it's this one. On this one. one. That's okay. Yes, Dr. Provost. I just think um, to the experts. Given the current climate, I would like to charge Mr. Lombardi with going back to his staff to explain the reasons why their idea failed. Um, I think. It may be impossible for them to understand without actually watching the video of this discussion. But I want it to be clear that I want it to be clear that, you know, you know, not a member of the committee. My interpretation of what the committee said was that they weren't rejecting the idea. They just wanted more time for people to weigh in on it. I would just add that we didn't reject the idea. We just asked. We rejected. We just asked for more time on it. By no means did we reject the idea. And in fact, I think you heard how much how supportive we are of the idea in general. So um, there's one more um, item, I believe, on your report. <laughs> this is the first reading on the co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Lombard. <laughs> he, he hasn't started. Uh, <laughs> well, this is just one more. Item, okay. so. so next up on our agenda is uh, policy JJ, co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Um, we are addressing this because there, uh, there have been um, some students who are enrolled in private schools and not in the Northampton schools that contacted the district wishing to access our extracurricular programs. Um, and so we decided to examine our policy on that. Um, we did reach out to the MASC um, and we examined um, both participation by homeschool students and private school charter school students. Um, and due to financial constraints, space constraints, resources that are limited, and um, increased legal um, liability that we would have, the decision by the subcommittee was made that um, students not enrolled in the Northampton Public Schools are ineligible to participate in co-curricular and extracurricular activities, with the exception of homeschooled students participating in athletics as per policy IHBGB. Um, and that is um, state law that allows homeschool students to participate in MIAA athletics. Um, and that was why that exception was made. Um, so should I make a motion? Please. Well, there's no yeah. motion. This is a. Oh, this is just a first reading. reading. First reading. <laughs> do you guys want to just do this in one reading? <laughs> We've been there. We've been there. Yeah. So that was a first reading, and we can we can vote on it in the second reading next time. <laughs> okay, great. Does anyone have any questions about it, though? Or. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll now move on. To less controversial. Oh, look, it's the program of studies. Program of studies, <laughs> Mr. Lombardi, you're back up. Um, the approval of the 2018-2019 NHS program of studies. Okay, so I guess we can go over, we can skip over the um, requirement <laughs> piece. Um, so I can get in, I'll just get into some of the major highlights and then I'll give you an opportunity for any questions that you might, may have. Um, one of the first changes that we've added is an introduction to the high school for the um, IT innovative um, um, pathway. I think you should be all aware of that. Okay, so that, that's an addition. Um, that'll be exciting. That'll be the first time that um, freshmen are hearing about that um, in the class of 2022. So we'll be hearing about that in March. Um, 
if you go to the course offerings for um, English on page 24, um, in regards to taking a look at, so we've always had four years of English, um, English one, two, three, and four, and um, sophomore year there's a regular English and then um, honors, junior it's AP and regular, senior it's AP and regular, and what the teachers decide is that they want for the seniors is to do away with the senior English itself um, and have the, strength, the standards um, spread out um, well, being taught in a variety of electives that would give students more choices. So they still have AP, but there's, give, there's an addition of world literature, science literature, literature in the screen, um, modern Irish literature, the graphic novel, and the art of poetry. Those will be um, classes now for seniors to take that will meet the senior um, requirement. And AP, sorry. Yeah. Wait. So what? The, and, and the AP, so there's AP literature, and the, so there's no English Great. four? Yep. Okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. If you go to science, I'm mean, actually history. We are going to be on a rotation basis now for some of our electives. So you can see for 2018-2019 um, is on page 33. Um, psychology and history of Islamic world will be offered next year in the 2019-2020 um, women's studies, um, sociology, history of the Civil War, and black history will be offered. To carry the, the number of electives we have, we have to rotate them. Um, of course, sign up kind of sometimes big classes and small classes, so to better utilize our resources, we have to go on a rotation. And find that putting the, that information in the program of study, students can plan ahead much, much better. In science, um, we are looking to add um, some more um, general science courses. Um, we'll be adding an earth and space science and a natural history of New England. Um, and again, this will, will be um, more elective, science electives for our, for our students. In math, um, as, as Elena had mentioned, one of the, in terms of our schedule, and as we always are constantly reviewing our schedule, one of the biggest challenges we have, and Mr. Moore brought that on too, is um, you know four classes a semester, eight for a school year. If you take some of our, a lot of our AP courses, can really clog up a schedule by, by being full year. And so we're, we're always, and as our students pre made their presentation, the impact of AP, it's, you know, it's on our radar to take a look at that. So in math, I'm um, in working with um, Ms. Um, Stavely Hale and Ms. Matlock, taking a look at our AP offerings and calculus of the best way to provide access and provide choice for our students. They've reconfigured the calculus um, sequence. So um, after you go through the IMs, and then you get, after you do the honors pre-calc, the pre-calc, you have an opportunity to go into calculus or honors calculus A. That'll be one semester. From there, you can go into one semester course of a, um, AP Calc AB, followed by, if you wanted to, an um, advanced placement Calc BC. We figured what that is doing, it's spreading it out over three semesters, giving students choices and not locking them into a full year of math. They can spread it out if they want it. We are adding an AP on page 47 on computer science. Next year, um, we'll be able to have a full complement of, AP, of um, computer science from computer science one um, through the computer science two with honors components as well as adding an AP mobile <coughs> computer um, of science principles, which is basically uh, working on um, apps. And those are the major course changes, and the rest is pretty much cosmetic and, you know, cleaning it up. Howard and then I think you're in. Oh, I'm sorry, you do that. Yes, he calls me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, the hierarchy here. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Sorry, Mayor. <laughs> yeah, minor. Back to the AP thing. So, tell me about AP tests. Are they all in the spring? Yes. So, in a way, there's it, there's it's strange because AP courses are offered in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so when you're building a schedule, if you if you throw everything to the spring, you really students without even do. Um, 
less choice. And I think it would be overburdensome for a student to have, you know, we have some students taking three or four to have them all fall in one semester. But you're right, there's that dynamic that if you have something, a single, if you have a one semester AP in the fall. It's a long time till the test. Yeah. And there's no way around that, right? The tests are only offered. That, that's, yeah, they have their set schedule. And then I have this, <coughs> so okay, and then I have this other question, which was in our presentation right at the previous meeting at 645, um, mentioned about the, the way the cost of AP tests go up if you're taking more than one test. In the program of studies, it says that there may be some sort of a prorated fee for students taking multiple AP exams. That's the process that we're going to be we're taking from the money that was given um, from the school committee, the, the, um, the mayor help from the city, and a grant that Nancy Cheevers put together. We're going to be taking a look at how we can um, facilitate that support. First, we'll be. So, has that not been happening in the past? We didn't have that. that no, that has not. That last year was the first year that funding um, uh, on a state and federal level stopped. So that's where we came forward next year, like we're really running into this. And at the same time, there's just a growing phenomenon that, um, you know, the tests are getting close to $100 per test. So it's not just for the families that, you know, meet the, the um, qualifications for free and reduced lunch. It's a lot of very typical families, you know, that their students want to take three or four mm -hmm. tests. You're talking three or $400, mm -hmm. you know, ballpark. Okay, so, so what it says in the, the, the program of studies about how there may be some support yes. for that is, is a new thing compared to like what our report was before, yeah? Yes, we, 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 we Like last year, this There's always been something from before. The, you, refunds used to happen from the board. And then last year, we, so we kept this part in there because last year when that happened, this had already been printed the, the previous year. Um, so we are gonna have a committee together to talk about what, how are we gonna balance that type of thing and support mm -hmm. students in need. We're, we're gonna have to develop the process and um, what would the rate be? I don't have the specifics to that right, right now. Other questions about the, yes, Ms. Foss. Um, I have an observation, I'll call it. Maybe it's a question <coughs> about the calculus sequence, which looks like it's changed a little bit. And the observation slash concern is now there's something called honors calculus that appears to be required in order, before you take AB calculus. Um, and I think AB Calculus used to be a whole year, so essentially two courses, and now it's being replaced by Honors Calculus followed by one semester of AB Calculus. So there's not a huge change there, but now there's also BC Calculus, which requires both of those. So in our school, to get through BC Calculus essentially takes three classes, three of those 32. And my comment is that just feels like a lot. Um, Typically, AB calculus is one year, um, so one semester at our school, and typically BC is two. And I think there's a lot of kids that should be able to do it in that amount of time, and I'm sure there's some kids that would benefit from having this extra semester. And I wonder um, if people, if the teachers are concerned that in order for a kid to get through BC calculus, they need to take three classes to get there, or if that's been a discussion or if that's just if there's a reason we're doing it that way I think they were they were discussing it Miss Steve Hill Miss Matlock um, taking a look at the combination of resources taking it um, that to have two full to have a B and B C B full year um, really locks students into a into a schedule and reduces the numbers as well and the feeling was by doing an honors a where they're going to be prepping the students honors a you know um, some students could stop there but they would also be focusing on the A that would gear them up for the one semester A. So, so each one there's gonna be kind of build up and planning to go into the next one. I, I mean, I appreciate that, but the course called pre-calculus really should get a student ready for AB calculus. And, um, and, and I'll leave it at that. That's just a comment, and I think three classes in calculus is a lot. Okay. I just wanted to make a point to um, Mr. Moore talking about AP courses in the spring. Um, yes, it is it is really challenging to have a fall semester AP course and then take a test in the spring, but the way the test falls in May, um, having that one semester AP in the spring leaves no time um, for a class. You know, I took AP statistics one semester. It would be impossible to get through that material from Feb early February to May. So it is challenging, um, but it's definitely easier to have it in the fall semester than in the spring due to time. 
Um, unfortunately. Um, the other question I had was I've been hearing for the past few years some buzz about AP environmental science. Um, and I noticed that's not in the program of studies, or I didn't hear you mention it. Um, so I was, is it being offered? I didn't, I didn't read it that closely. Is it being offered? Give me a second. Okay. Yeah. Is this being offered? Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I just didn't hear you mention it, so I was wondering. I failed to. My, my, I'm sorry. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Ms. Busansky, I'm sorry. I just was wondering if you could tell us a little more about American Sign Language. It's a so that's con that's contingent on some um, other variables. So th this is uh, maybe I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, it's really sensitive to a specific student who needs that really. Yeah. So it's yeah. Contingency. So it could happen. We want to put it there. Yeah, I want you to have that knowledge. If, if that so it was could a, be a course, if it if it came up, it would be a course. It would be an elective based course that a student could mm -hmm. take. That's it. Mm -hmm. It is not. Beyond that, I can't say any more. Okay. And what would, the, what would the, the shelf life of it be? Where would it grow? It would be. Um, it's contingent on some very sensitive things. That's all, I, that's all I can say. But we felt that if it was going to be there, I want you to have some knowledge, and it would. It could be a very unique um, and interesting elective for our student body. I would like to add that I was on the snow day hanging out with five students who were all talking about how much they wanted to learn American Sign Language from the high school. So, and that they were already practicing some things and um, they are, you know, so I think that that's really exciting. Thank you. We're excited for it. Other questions about the program of study? Okay. Make a motion to approve the 2018-2019 NHS program of study. Second. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you, everybody. You're batting 500 tonight. Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Get it. Good night. Thank you. Uh, okay. The next item on the agenda we already took care of. That was the bid award uh, to Durham. So next we have a job description for the school business administrator. I'll turn this over to you. So proving once again that time flies, um, we need to begin the process of our search for a new school business administrator to replace Candy when she retires in the fall. So the first step in this process was going through the old job description and updating it. One of the major updates is that it's called school business administrator, which is the current terminology instead of school business manager. Um, there were also some very strange physical requirements that we we um, revised in that process. I mean, the main physical requirement should be to be able to endure the superintendent, but we <laughs> couldn't put that in there. Um, so I, we're, we're proposing this job description so that we can uh, post the position and then begin the process of forming a committee and interviewing candidates. Our goal would be to try to have an offer into someone by the end of the school year which would give them an opportunity to work off their notice over the summer and have some overlap with Candy in the fall. Okay, any questions about the job description? Just make a motion, Mr. Vice Chair. Sure. I make a motion um, on the job description for the school business administrator. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this updated job description. <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's approved. Next, we have a vote to surplus outdated readers and writers workshop materials. I'll turn this over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. In your materials, you'll see a February 1st memorandum from Dr. Cheevers. Um, this involves a small lot of first edition readers and writers workshop books that we need to um, get out of the district because they're no longer the current editions. <coughs> Field State is interesting in using it in some teacher prep courses. Make a motion to surplus outdated readers and writers workshop materials. Second. 
There's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of this surplusing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a couple of gift-related uh, votes. Uh, the first is the return of a monetary gift, uh, 46350 uh, to Jackson Street, which um, you may want to just explain the next two votes together yes. since they kind of inter interrelate. Yep. Um, yes, because it's very unusual to have a vote to return a gift. That's not something we normally do. But as the memo from Principal Agna and the PTO mentions, the PTO has been working on a renovation of the Jackson Library for about three or four years. About a year ago, the school committee accepted a monetary gift of up to $100,000 for renovation so that they be could begin to piecemeal that work. One of the major first pieces they were going to do was to replace the flooring in the library. Um, the memo outlines they weren't able to get it done that summer. We had reached the state stage working with central services where they had a contract ready to go out to a contractor. At that point, the PTO donated the approximately $46,000 that was needed for that contract. As they went through executing it, they found out that that vendor was no, a no longer able to provide the type of flooring that the PTO was looking for under the, the contract that we were doing it with. So rather than trying to go out to bid and figuring out a different way to do it, it made more sense to let the PTO hire the contractor, which has, has actually become easier now under some state regulations or state different state interpretations of regulations where we can actually accept the gift. The PTO can go out. They actually don't have to deal with prevailing wages, so they may get a better price. So at this point, what we need to do is to have a vote to return the $46,350 that was donated by the PTO for the floor back to the PTO, and then a separate vote following to accept a gift of a completed floor at the Jackson Library. That would also require going to the school committee because material gifts in excess of, uh, city council, excuse me, material gifts in excess of 10,000 also have to be approved by the city council. So the two votes are before you tonight to start this process. Move to return of the monetary gift in the sum of $46,350 to Jackson Street PTO. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded to return the gift. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The gift is gone. Now <laughs> I make a motion to accept the gift uh, from Jackson Street PTO for a new floor for the library. Second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the gift is back. Uh, and we'll bring that to the city council at their next meeting to get them to vote on the um, on that as well. The next item, turning the page to page two, um, the vote. This is another gift. Uh, this is a gift, an anonymous gift uh, through the food service department. And I'll let Ms. Walczyk explain this. Yeah, we've had a lot of discussion over the last couple of years about the growing amount of food service debt for the students. So um, Principal Madden actually had somebody come forward at Ryan Road School offering to donate $1,024.80, which was the amount of the debt for her school at that point that the, the offer was made. So with much thanks, we would ask you to accept this gift. It will be applied to each of the students in that building that had debt at that point to wipe out the debt through the date of the donation. Make a motion to accept the anonymous gift of $1,024.80 uh, $1, to the food service uh, for Ryan Road school lunch debt. Okay. Um, any discussion about this? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. <coughs> Uh, next is a gift from NABC, <coughs> and I'll have Ms. Walzik explain that one. Yes, this is a two-part gift. Part is where they, NABC will be making a payment directly, and part of it is where they will give us the funds to make a payment. Um, the athletic director has worked with NABC. There's not enough indoor time in the high school to get in all the spring practices in light of the field conditions. So she's worked with them, and the NABC is willing to cover the rental fees at two different facilities so the students can start indoor practices earlier and then they will do donate the money to us to pay for the transportation to get the students to those sites. So the total value of this donation is $16,383.76. Okay. 
make a motion to accept the gift for M from the N NABC in the amount of $16,383.76 to NHS Athletics for Spring Sports Practice Facility Rental and Transportation. Is there a second? Second. Any questions about this? Uh, I'm item? just wondering what happens if it's a beautiful spring and in the next several weeks we're able to go right outside. Is this a contract we're already committed to or how does that work? I don't know if they've committed to it or not. I can follow up with the athletic director. The groundhog did see his shadow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I retract my... It's, it's science. It's science. Yeah. Right. Silly it's me. Science. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> okay. Um, did we vote on that? Not yet. All those in favor, you. Um, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, another uh, gift. Um, this is the uh, NHS PTO to the band. And Ms. Walzik, do you want to? Yes, this is one we've seen from the PTO a couple times. They're making a $3,000 donation to the band program at the high school. Motion to accept the gift of uh, NHS PTO in the amount of $3,000 to the band. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, we have a JFK PTO gift for a field trip, and Ms. Walzik. Yes, this is $1,500 to pay for five buses to go to Amherst for a UMass program, Student Day of Learning. And we're asking that this donation be allowed to go into the JFK Student Activity Account, which is where they paid for all the other expenses related to that event. Make a motion to accept the gift of JFK PTO in the amount of $1,500 for a UMass field trip transportation. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. <laughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a gift of, uh, of computers from Smith College to the district. Ms. Walzik? Yes, I think this is the second time this year we've been here with a donation from Smith. This is for 15 IMAX. Um, again, this is used equipment that they are donating to us so that we can recycle it through our system. The 15 IMAX have a value of approximately $3,000. And then there are 30 PCs with a value of approximately $8,400. We accept the gift from Smith College for 15 IMAX and 30 PCs to the Northampton Public School District. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of accepting those gifts, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So those are all of the uh, all of the scheduled votes tonight on the various gifts. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Zahowski usually does this, but I, I, I want to beat him to the punch. So this is uh, nearly eighty thousand dollars of generous donation, <coughs> without which we couldn't do the work that we do. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Meyer. <laughs> oh, Mr. Meyer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I said Mr. Moore. Oh, yeah. Now, <laughs> now I see you answered anything. <laughs> okay. So next we'll turn to um, Ms. Busansky, who is our uh, Northampton Prevention Coalition liaison uh, for a uh, quick report and, uh, on their last meeting. Right. Okay, I could make a joke that we're going to have a lengthy discussion, but we're not. It's a quick report. We could have a lengthy discussion. But, um, so after attending my very first Northampton Prevention Coalition steering committee meeting, um, the hot topic was the re zoning around retail marijuana shops. And it came to my attention that um, we as a school committee might want to weigh in in terms of a letter. We have obviously we have no real authority, but would we want to, uh, in the form of a letter or a resolution, make some kind of statement weighing in on retail marijuana shops? And, uh, the mayor has a lot more information on this topic than me, and maybe he could just update us very briefly on where we are at with, I know the city council is planning some um, listening sessions or forums to hear, um, but there's a number of issues, including the buffer zone, will there be a cap on the number of uh, retail marijuana shops or not, um, that we might feel impact our students. And I, before I kind of move ahead in any direction, I wanted to understand the will of the school committee on that. Um, so uh, there has been zoning introduced uh, to the planning board and to the um, city council. Um, 
and by law the planning board has to hold a public hearing and on the zoning and you know a, a formal public hearing that's noticed in the newspaper etc um, and make a recommendation and then the city council has to hold a public hearing um, and so currently <coughs> the school committee is scheduled to hold their hearing on February 20 mm -hmm. I'm sorry the, the uh, planning board is scheduled to hold their hearing on the uh, 22nd I believe it is um, of February um, and the uh, City Council is going to have um, a uh, they're they're gonna have a hearing on the on the zoning um, but they're also going to have a hearing separate from that their Community Resources Committee um, is going to have a hearing to get input from the community on just sort of more general issues um, and that's going to include presentations from the Prevention Coalition, for example, in Spiffy. Um, it's going to include um, <coughs> presentations from the Board of Health, um, who also have concerns about this. Um, and it's going to also most likely include um, presentations from uh, marijuana um, ag advocates, people who support <coughs> the ballot measure, um, and possibly including uh, New England Treatment Access, which is our currently licensed medical marijuana uh, uh, dispensary, um, they may also make a presentation. So that's happening, unfortunately, it's happening on the 27th. Um, it began, During our meeting. Well, the, the forum is at 5 o'clock, so mm -hmm. that portion of the meeting is from 5 to 7. Uh, the zoning portion that legislative matters will take up is from 7 to 9. Um, so uh, the zoning that I put forward basically mirrors the zoning that we have for the medical marijuana dispensaries, which we went through a pretty lengthy process that uh, the Prevention Coalition weighed in on and the Board of Health weighed in on and the City Council and the Planning Board weighed in on. Um, it would basically say that retail uh, dispensary or retail um, shops could only go in areas of the city that are zoned for retail. Um, and that production facilities, um, which is where you know cultivation and processing, et cetera, can only happen in industrial uh, places that are zoned for in industry, things like the like the industrial park, um, for example. Um, it does implement a buffer zone from uh, schools, public or private, that offer kindergarten through twelfth grade, which is what the which is what the regulations say. Um, for medical marijuana, we implemented a 200-foot buffer. <coughs> we are mimicking that again for the uh, recreational 200-foot uh, buffer. Um, most of our schools are in residential neighborhoods. Um, uh, there's uh, not really any uh, that are close to a retail outlet that would be within that 200-foot buffer um, currently. Um, we are also uh, putting in the in the zoning ordinance that um, that we will not allow a pre-existing non-conforming uh, retail use to be converted to a uh, <coughs> marijuana dispensary, which means that for some of our historical um, anomalous businesses that are in residential zones and they're grandfathered um, as businesses, those could not be turned into um, uh, retail uh, marijuana. Uh, facilities so that's kind of the crux of the zoning there is no cap proposed on the number um, and I um, <coughs> said to uh, I actually believe that if there was a well I personally don't support a cap but I don't I didn't want it to be part of the zoning because <coughs> I don't believe that that's a, um, a zoning decision that the planning board should have to deal with it's really a political decision of the of the community that really the city council and mayor uh, should handle so um, if a cap were to be put in place the council has the ability to pass an ordinance to put some kind of a cap in place so it's not really uh, a zoning issue from my perspective um, and then the only other thing I would add is that if you read the regulations um, pretty much um, the, the the legislation and the Commission regulations um, strive to tr to have this particular use treated like like alcohol like liquor stores basically 
um, and our zoning currently has no buffer zones for bars or liquor stores, um, and we have no requirement and no special requirements around signage or things like that. So um, it's fairly consistent with how we treat, you know, liquor stores, places that sell tobacco, et cetera, versus how we're treating uh, how we're treating these particular outlets. So that's the quick summary. Again, the planning board has their process, but then there is going to be a separate process to try to get additional feedback um, from the community um, if the city council wanted to implement additional um, ordinances in addition to the zoning. Such as a cap. That is correct. Just for example. And for let me example. just add that the reason to bring it up tonight is because of the timing mm -hmm. behind of all this, which I know that, so the state regulations haven't been, are not going to be finalized till March 15th? Yeah, the, the Cannabis Commission is holding hearings right now. There's draft regulations that have been promulgated, and they just had a hearing in Holyoke and Greenfield, and I think they're in Danvers today. So they're having a series of 10 hearings around the state to get feedback. Uh, they're then going to finalize the regulations um, by March 15th, and under the timeline they've laid out, applications would be available by April 1st with a goal, well, kind of a requirement that, that they be issue, begin issuing licenses on July 1st. Right. Um, I will say that as a requirement of applying for a license, each individual licensee is required to hold a community um, meeting um, and they're, they're supposed, and the applicant themselves will have to have their own community meeting about their own particular, whether it's a dispensary or a cultivation facility or a testing lab, whatever it is, um, and they're required to, there's certain notice requirements, they have to notify the public, and, and so each one, of, each one of them will have their own particular hearing so that the public has a chance to weigh in with the, with the applicant. That's a requirement of the license. Um, to even apply, you have to do that. So there will also be further process on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis um, mm -hmm. that where people have an opportunity to weigh in. So. so mostly, I just wanted to bring this to the committee to see if you have any interest in pursuing, right, giving any kind of letter or opinion or further having a further, which would require a further discussion of what that letter might contain or not. And that's a fine by me as well. but. I felt like I would be remiss. It's a big topic. It will have an impact on our students. And did we want to have any say on it? And just and just to be clear, I mean, this was a 21, you know, like tobacco and like alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's a 21 and older, you know, kind of business. So it's not um, these. So just to be clear, I mean, and obviously there's always the concerns like we have with alcohol and tobacco that underage people will have access to them. So that's definitely going to be a major part of the enforcement and part of the state's responsibility as they license these. So, um, and, you know, I'm sure that the Prevention Coalition will certainly weigh in. I mean, they've already weighed in with me. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but you know what? Um, all I can say is we, you know, we went through this, I heard all those same issues, and I thought we put together really good zoning for medical, and we've had no issues with medical marijuana. Um, and there's been one dispensary that's that's opened in Northampton. So um, so that's all I can all I can say is that's been the track record so far. Um, so I mean again, they're gonna have definitely gonna have an opportunity to weigh in with the city council. They're also gonna have an opportunity to weigh in with the zoning. Um, the default ban or the default uh, buffer zone is 500 feet under the legislation. So there's a default. So if we do nothing, um, it's a 500 foot ban. Um, we we chose to align it with our current 200 foot um, buffer zone that we developed for medical marijuana. Um, but again, we have no buffer zones for any other use in the city, um, whether it's you know purchasing handguns or buying tobacco or buying alcohol. We don't put a. There's no buffer zone from schools. So. So the question you're asking the committee is, does the committee want to take some sort of formal role on either the zoning or or other uh, legislation? Right. And I just thought it might, I mean, I know we're all, it's very late, and so it's really a hard topic to I see all the blank faces. So 
it's hard to talk about this at this hour, but um, but yes, after I just wanted to run it by everyone, so I wasn't you know either either no doing nothing or going forward without having some input from the committee because I'm really I have been able to talk to the mayor extensively about it, so I feel a lot better about all that's gone into it. And thank you for all the information you've shared with us tonight because I think there's a lot of misinformation or lack of information and more will be coming out obviously but I think it's helpful to sort of hear all that's gone into it so um, but I just wanted everyone else to be on the same page with me and the only I thing feel like I was in a position to make that decision by myself and the only thing I would say is that most of this is going to be regulated by the state meaning they're going to have all the inspection requirements and all the um, you know compliance checks and um, so, you know inspections the other thing that the legislation requires them to do um, including using some of the taxes that they'll be collecting is the um, underage you know the education around underage mm -hmm. it's like written into the legislation that they have to do that um, much like I think they do with tobacco and alcohol now so that's that's actually embedded in the legislation because I know people have been saying like the city needs to do that, um, you know, but again, the city didn't create this regime. This is the state created regime, and actually, the law requires them to do that to be able to provide that education with the with the much larger uh, tax they'll be collecting. So, um, so I just that's another important thing that there will be um, the same kinds of stuff that we're doing around the prevention coalition with tobacco and alcohol. Um, and other kinds of, uh, you know, and drugs, that that's also a requirement of this as well. Ms. Fallon. Um, I guess my position, having come, coming off of my stint as liaison to the Prevention Coalition, is um, initially I thought that that I would, I thought it would be good for the for the school committee to weigh in, but it sounds like all of the pieces that we as a committee would be concerned about like prevention and the buffer <coughs> zone and all of those things are being addressed mm -hmm. and I would hate to have to send you to all of these meetings to speak on our behalf so um, so I I while I have concerns I am comfortable I, I think with just keeping an eye on what's going on mm -hmm. at, at the community meetings and not taking a formal position and it wouldn't preclude any individual school committee member from weighing in individually as a you know as an individual just the question would be the whole school committee um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of partial to the zoning but that's because I'm sponsoring it <laughs> so <laughs> I'm probably not going to vote to support a something against the zoning but that's just me but, yeah. I, I agree with Laura mm -hmm. that I think that there's a process in place and we can participate but don't need to make a group statement at this time and I would agree with that and I also point out that you know we we already know that we already have sort of some information about marijuana use by our students from both from Spiffy and also from our um, you know, school nurse uh, screening and um, and not only information, but in terms of school nurse screenings, there's actually intervention already in place. And so, you know, I, I feel like that's more like where we should be concerned is, is if, if in fact the sort of possible greater access um, of marijuana to our students happens, we already have some things in place to, to deal with that, um, I think appropriately. And um, that would, so, I, so I think that's, so I'm glad for that, but I, you know, I think that's where to pay attention and see if, if, if what we have in place is adequate and as it goes forward. So, do you um, have the feedback? You. Yep. Okay. But thank you for thank yeah. you for thank you. bringing it forward. Um, okay. okay. So the next item on the agenda is the um, fourth reading on the naming of the Leeds Elementary Baseball Diamond in honor of Jim Myas. Um, Mr. Meyer, do you have anything you want to add on this fourth reading? Uh, no, just as required by policy. Um, we have to ha hold this under consideration for six months, and these are two individuals who provided great service to the children of Leeds community of Northampton. 
we will be taking a vote on this at the end of our sixth month. Okay. And again, the, so that that's oh, the. It's still. That's the fourth reading uh, on, on the baseball diamond in honor of Jim Myas, and we'll also consider this the fourth reading on the naming of the Leeds Elementary Playground Pavilion in honor of Julie Clark. So that's our fourth reading on those items. Um, next, we have the uh, a vote to authorize the payment of a late bill for special education tuition from school choice. Ms. Walzik. Yes, late last school year we were notified by the Collaborative for Educational Services that they had come across some FY14 invoices that they could not find payment for as we researched it, neither could we. We think this possibly was a case of our not believing we were responsible for those expenses. Um, there's been further legal research done. We do believe now that we are responsible. As part of your budget each year, you vote an amount of money within the school choice appropriation for prior fiscal year bills. We've exhausted most of that this year. We had actually reduced it down to $10,000 this year because we've been doing good with our prior year bills. So at this point, I'm recommending that you vote to amend the school choice budget for prior year, prior fiscal year invoices from $10,000 up to $26,000 so that we may make this payment to the collaborator. Uh, make a motion to authorize the payment of a late bill for special education tuition from school choice from 10000 up to 26000 okay. Is there a second? Second. Is there any questions or discussions? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that uh, payment is authorized. <coughs> Next, we have the business administrative report and the personnel report from Ms. Walzek. <coughs> yes, I'll try and do this really quick. You've got the regular monthly Munis financial report. Um, I've outlined briefly in it. We're continuing to watch the areas of the budget, including some additional staff that we needed to put on at Bridge Street School um, to identify funding sources for those before the fiscal year ends. You've got a couple of gifts tonight. Gifts accepted by the <coughs> school principals from the PTOs that are under their $1,000 limit. At Bridge Street School, there was a gift of $250 from the PTO to fund part of the Enchanted Circle Theater performance. Um, that is also a grant from the state as well as a little bit of school funding going into it, so the PTO contributed part of it for us. And then there is also a gift at Bridge Street not sure this one actually has to come to you, but it was put on here. It was a gift from the PTO of $775 for gift for retirees. And then the superintendent accepted gifts of $500 from L3KEO to purchase math investigation materials for our Spanish speaking students. A gift of $500 from Donna Bell Casas for the robotics program at the high school and a gift of, uh, with a value of $300 from Durham School Services for transportation to the Special Olympics being held in South Hadley. And then you have a copy of one warrant that was approved by your representative since your last meeting. And then moving on to the very short personnel report for January, we basically had five hires, five separations, and two people within the district that were transferred to other positions. Okay. Thank you very much. And, um, uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Provost's presentation served as his uh, superintendent's report. So um, we have no new business. Uh, future business and meeting dates, we have the Budget <coughs> Property Subcommittee of February 12th, 3.30 p.m. in the City Hall Hearing Room. We have the School Committee meeting February 27th at 7.15 p.m., JFK Community Room. We have the School Committee meeting of March 8th, 7.15 p.m. in the JFK Community Room, and we have the Rules and Policy Subcommittee on March 14th, 3.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. Next item on the agenda, we do have a request for an executive session, and I will ask the Vice Chair to make that motion. Motion for a uh, request for an executive session in the JFK Principals Conference Room under Massachusetts General Law, Open Meeting, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, MUP-18-6456, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going to the session. Is there a second on that second. motion? 
Okay. Um, that requires a <coughs> call vote. Yes will be to go into executive session. No would be not to. Yes. 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 Okay. So I do have to advise the public that we are now going to uh, move into an executive session because to hold this discussion in a public session might compromise our litigation strategy. And I also have to advise the public that we will adjourn directly from executive session. With that, we'll now move into the executive session.